All right, let's get started. On behalf of the Alliance for Children's Rights, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the path to racial equity and child welfare, valuing family and community. We're deeply indebted to all the people who have been working for generations to make the child welfare system more equitable and just for Black, Native, and Latino families and communities. Today's conversations build on their efforts and wouldn't be possible without their advocacy and activism. A few housekeeping notes. The morning session of the summit will be recorded. If you're not comfortable with being recorded, please make sure to turn your camera off. All attendees will be muted during the morning session, except of course for our speakers and panelists. Please make sure to choose the speaker view button at the top right hand corner of your screen to view the event speakers only. This is a large meeting, so by clicking on speaker view, you'll see our guest speakers highlighted on your screen. We'd love for you to join us in a Twitter conversation about the summit. Please use the hashtags path to racial justice and value family and community to share your thoughts during the day. Please take breaks as needed during the morning session. We'll try to make time for breaks in between the panel discussions and we're also gonna have a one hour lunch break at 1 p.m. And thanks for your engagement and attention today. We appreciate your patience as we navigate any challenges that come with this virtual format. Before we dive into the agenda, I'd like to acknowledge our co-sponsors and co-organizers. Susan Abrams, Phyllis Strickland, and Luciana Spidler of the Children's Law Center of California, Taylor Dudley of the Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families, and Dennis Schmiel, Emily Berger, and Rachel Ewing of the Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers Incorporated. I'd also like to thank the following people for their contributions to the policy report that we'll, that we'll be discussing throughout the day. Delia Sharp, Blair Kreutzer, and Kimberly Clough of the California Tribal Families Coalition, and DeMonte Thompson of Twinspire. We're thrilled to open our morning session with a spoken word performance by Kid Tree, who's a young leader in the LA Opportunity Youth Collaborative. That performance will be followed by the remarkable California State Assembly member, Wendy Carrillo, who represents the 51st District. After Assembly Member Carrillo's remarks, we're gonna listen and learn from the brilliant speakers on the first panel of the day, which will feature a young person, a parent, and a relative caregiver who've been directly impacted by the child welfare system. That critical conversation will be followed by a lively and informative discussion during the second panel, where we'll hear from experts working, working to reform the child welfare system from within, including a judge, counsel for parents and children, and a DCFS social worker. After the panel discussions, I'll present the 17 policy recommendations we've developed following conversations with our co-sponsors and other community partners. And we'll close the morning with a riveting presentation by Dr. Jessica Price, Director of the Florida Institute for Child Welfare. Dr. Price will map out what revolutionary change in the child welfare system could look like. Now join me in welcoming Kid Tree, who composed a spoken word piece specifically for this event. Kid Tree is an entertainer and a creator who advocates for a more equitable child welfare system. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dimitri Dunn. I'm known to the world as Tree or Kid Tree, K-I-D-T-R-I-I. -I. It's a pleasure to be here. I am an entertainer and an artist, a poet, a model, actor, and so on and such. It's a pleasure to be here. I will provide some spoken word for you, and I hope you enjoy. If it seems a little rushed, I've kind of been busy working, and I'm on set a lot, so... I probably rushed it a little bit, but without further ado, let's begin. Let me start off by saying life has been hard thus far. And if I had to pick a part, I'd say growing up in South Central LA, it was Hispanics versus Blacks versus Asians versus Whites. My entire community was ripped apart. And so it was hard for me to love something or be connected to something when even my own people preferred to be in the dark with no one in the light to remind us of who we are. Kings and queens who deserve the same opportunities as other people who thrive outside of our community. See, it's hard to be connected to culture and community when my culture is something that was never taught to me. In schools, that they teach me about their history to skip over my history. All I see around me is misery, so it's easy to be disconnected from that. When I have no friends or family, no mentors, no aunties or siblings or teachers to have my back, instead, I struggle with my identity. Due to me not knowing my culture, I have no connection to my roots, which in turn, my life is full of inconsistencies. Moving from place to place and school to school, 
There was no stability for me. At the end of the day, I just want to live my life on terms of my own, so I take it slow. No matter what I do or where I go, I'm content with knowing that my future still has hope. Thank you for watching. I hope you guys have a wonderful summit, and it was a pleasure to be here. Bye. Good morning, everyone. My name is... Thank you, Kitri. Next, we're delighted and honored to share an address from State Assembly Member Wendy Correa. Assembly Member Correa was elected to the Assembly in 2017 and represents the 51st District, which includes parts of the city of, of Los Angeles and unincorporated East Los Angeles. She's been an advocate for education, immigration reform, environmental justice, healthcare for all, job creation, and innovation. I'm now going to share my screen and show her address. Assembly District in our state legislature, which includes the community. Hello, my name is Wendy Carrillo, and I proudly represent the 51st Assembly District in our state legislature, which includes the communities of Northeast LA and East Los Angeles, where I grew up. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in the Path to Racial Equity and Child Welfare, Valuing Family and Community Summit. The child welfare system is meant to be a safety net for all children whose families face crisis. Yet biases have historically influenced how children and family enter the system, as well as the processes that take place that lead to family separation. Racial and ethnic disparities continue to persist. Data has shown and proven that children of color enter the foster care system at higher rates and remain in that system for longer periods of time. There are a number of steps that we must take to dismantle the institutional racism that persists. Hello. My name is Wendy Carrillo, and I proudly represent the fifth crisis, the opportunity to seek help from specialists as opposed to immediately referring another matter to law enforcement would demonstrate a commitment to prevention and show that we value families and are willing to invest in them. Providing all families pre-petition legal representation would help pave a path forward toward greater equity. Earlier this month, I introduced Assembly Bill 656, to fight against racial injustice and advance equity and inclusion in the child welfare system by creating a blind removal pilot in the decision-making process determining whether children are to be removed from their parents' home. Replacing the status quo with a blind removal process meets perhaps the most critical need and ensures biases are minimized during removal. Adverse childhood experiences compound. ACEs occur prior to removal, during removal, and following removal, and even when reunification occurs. If our focus is in fact child welfare, then our focus should be to provide families with resources. AB 656 is a step in the right direction, and I, com and I am committed to California's families and children, especially those that are black and brown, who deserve a fighting chance and ultimately live with dignity. Let's reimagine child welfare our safety net, and what it means to keep families together so that homes can be safe, stable, healthy, and whole. Thank you to the Alliance for Children's Rights, the Children's Law Center, the Women's Policy Institute, and all of you for your support. And I wish you a great summit. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for bearing with me with the technical difficulties. We can send out that video later, just so you can watch the whole thing without an interruption. Um, so before we hear from the first panel, I would like to think, I would like everyone in the audience to think about and respond to the following question. What information would you like to walk away with from this summit? Please answer now in the chat. I'll just give it a minute or two and then I'll pull out some some really notable answers.
So I see ideas to empower our clients from B. Gomez. Steps I can take to reform, abolish these oppressive systems. Concrete strategies. Practical steps to transform ideas into practice. Strategies to improve outcomes and address disproportionality. So what I'm really taking away from this is that people are both excited for the conversations we're having today, but they are especially interested in getting concrete actionable solutions for addressing the racial disproportionality and disparities in the child welfare system. And that's exactly what we aim to walk away from this event with. So I'm really glad to hear that we're all on the same page. So now on to the first panel. Any conversation about reforming child welfare must be grounded in the experiences and perspectives of the families and communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the system. The speakers on this panel represent the viewpoints of youth, kin caregivers, and parents, and they're actively working to address racism and bias in the system through their professional work and their advocacy. First, I'd like to introduce Erica Glenn. Erica is a parent partner at Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers Incorporated, where she advocates for other parents in their quest to reunify with their children. Erica has successfully reunified with her son after 26 months and 21 days of fighting. She's turned her experiences of systemic oppression in the child welfare system into a dedicated living amends to her grace gift, her son. After earning her associate's degree in psychology and social work from Rio Hondo College, Erica plans to pursue a bachelor's in social work to further prepare for her role in empowering families of color. Next is Sanika Levias. Sanika is a registered nurse, realtor, and advocate. Sanika is the founder of Just Us Moz, the Atiera Westbrook Project, a grassroots nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide preventative and supportive services to victims of violence and their surrounding communities. Sanika founded the organization after losing her 21-year-old daughter to senseless gun violence in 2015. She and her husband are foster parents to their two-year-old grandson. Also joining us is Brene Phillips. Brene is a freshman at UC Merced and is engaged in supporting her community as a young leader with the Los Angeles Opportunity Youth Collaborative. She was previously working as, as a, she was previously a member of the United Friends of the Children Advisory Com Committee. And moderating the panel, we have DeMonte Thompson. DeMonte is the executive director and co-founder of Twinspire. DeMonte previously served as the resident director at Cal State Los Angeles, where he worked with leaders across the campus to enhance the services for first generation and foster youth students. Having been in foster care, he's uses his experience and knowledge to author books and policy reports to improve services for foster youth around the nation. He's currently pursuing his PhD at UCLA in urban schooling to continue system change for foster youth and marginalized students through Twinspire. We'll try to make time at the end of the conversation for audience questions. So please share any questions you might have in the chat. DeMonte, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you, David. And thank you everyone for being here today for this summit. Um, it's an honor to be a moderator for this panel. We have some incredible young people and uh, experts who are on this panel and I'm excited to, to be a part of it. I wanna start off a little bit about my, little, my history. Um, I was born and raised in Compton, California. Uh, my experience in foster care was unique. I was placed in care with my late great uncle. He sacrificed his retirement to take care of two big head skinny twin boys, my twin brother and I, and, uh, and my two other siblings. Um, this allowed me to maintain a connection with my black identity. You see, taking me away from my extended family would have been traumatic and led to, led to further uh, me being disconnected to who I am, my identity. But sometimes I, 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 I wonder to myself, what if my parents had some good jobs in my city, in my community, and were able to provide for me and my family. And maybe I would have never been in 
foster care or kinship care from the beginning? Or what if they had access to rehabilitation services and programs? Significant reforms are needed at the front end of the child welfare system because poverty is oftentimes used as a mechanism to push children into foster care. We need to provide resources for families who are in poverty or who are low income because there are multiple stressors that result from that experience. During the 80s and 90s, the war on drugs decimated my community and I saw it firsthand. The child's welfare system and their mission is to make sure that kids are in a safe place and eventually reunify with their family. But what if the system really prioritized allowing a child to stay in their family with resources instead of helping them get back to their family? I think we'll start with Erica. What are some resources you wish would have been available to you or that you wish you would known of or known about when you were first involved in the system? Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Erica Glenn. I'm a parent partner for the law office of Thomas Hayes. As in my bio, it said that my case was open for 26 months and 21 days. And to answer your question, for me, I wish that the culture of asking for help and resources was readily available. Um, I had my case in Sacramento, California, and I had no idea there were resources uh, such as a um, a overnight care that would have been available for my son for 30 days and I wouldn't have received an open CPS case during that time. I would have been given a mental health assessment. I would have been given an AOD assessment, which would have allowed me to uh, see what it was that needed to happen. Um, I was absolutely terrified. For me, um, the reality is microaggressions can be extremely strong when you don't look like me. Uh, I'm not ignorant to that. For me, it's extremely important to have representation. And when no one looked like me, I knew that I was going to fail. I knew it was going to be an uphill battle. Um, what I will tell you is during that time frame of my open case, I remember um, battling with the foster agency to make sure that my son was placed with a um, with a family that represented what I looked like. My son was placed with CPS the day after uh, his third birthday. For me, why that's important, why that's essential for me is because my son was so young, I wanted to make sure he had representation of mommy. That at my time where I wasn't able to provide for my child in the way that my son needed and the system stepped in and took care of my child, which is something I am grateful for. I still needed my son to have a roadmap to what I look like, to my community, to the essentials of my being. Um, so hope it helps there. Erica, you so eloquently spoke about the services uh, that may have prevented you and your sons from entering your son from entering the system. Another important issue is related to the topic of keeping families together is how the system identifies and recruits relative caregivers. Placing a child with relatives isn't the solution for every family. Difficulties can pop up when there's poverty at play and when there's trauma at play. And it's critical that the system not only locates relatives, but also provides them with the support they need to support the children when the parents are not able to. So that brings me to our next panelist, Sanika. What sorts of challenges did you encounter in getting your grandson placed with you? Well, um, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, my stepson got involved with drugs at an early age, and uh, he had a baby with a girl who was also involved in drugs. And my stepson went to jail and it forced the mother to go into a shelter because she didn't have anywhere else to go. And so when she got there, they drug tested her. And um, about three or four later, days later, they 
took the baby from her. And so um, after they took him, we, they didn't call us. We're here in Southern California, me and his father. We've been here for about five years and we didn't get a phone call at all. They contacted my mother-in-law who was in Northern California, but there's nothing that, there was nothing she could do being in Northern California. And uh, we tried relentlessly to contact someone because my, my stepson had called me screaming and crying and hollering that they took his baby. And so um, we, we tried, I tried, but they wouldn't give me any kind of information at all to even get the baby before he got into the system. And so I wish that would have been uh, available, like they, uh, just a little bit more time to find another family member to, to get the baby before he got into the system. Um, and then the next obstacle we ran into was that uh, they did identify us after about a month or so. Um, my husband, we had to do background checks and do all the things that, you know, you, that, that DCFS requires. And my husband has some things on his record, some arrests on his record, you know, over 20 years old. And um, as we know now, uh, there's tension and there's things that happen to young black men in their communities. And we're just, we're seeing them on video now because we have video, but back then 20 years ago, there was nothing, you know, it was nothing like it is now where people could see it. And so a, all, a lot of the arrests my husband had was just because he was the environment he was grew up in, where he was, who he was with. There was nothing recent on there. And so um, when they ran his record, he does not have any convictions. He, uh, nothing on his record, nothing, no convictions or anything on his record, but the seriousness of the charges he had on there, they told us that they had to check with the court reporters to make sure that they didn't make any mistakes. And, um, you know, the, the charges that they charged him with were bogus, but, you know, the, the things that happened to him as uh, police were abusing their power then, it came back to haunt us. And it took us over three months to get the baby into our household. Now I'm a registered nurse and a realtor. I have to have uh, fingerprints. I have to go through a lot of things. I'm clear, so why, couldn't I be trusted to take the baby while they figured out they had to go prove that um, my husband was safe enough to take care of his, his, his grandbaby. And so those are some of the obstacles that we went through in the beginning. Mm -hmm. In a way, uh, Sonika's story about the placement delay caused by her husband's arrest record speaks to the importance of cultural competency. So even though most people know that the police have a long history of harassing black people, Sonika's husband still had to prove that his arrest record wasn't a reason to prevent him from taking care of his grandson. If the person looking at his record had a real understanding of what black people go through, there would have been less of a delay. So right now the child welfare system isn't equipped to support black children and families. Based on the experience, my experience personally, I can say that I've, I would have experienced confusion around my racial identity had I not been able to stay with my, fam with my family and had that connection. Brene, based on your experience, what could the child welfare system do to honor culture and identity? Um, so first I wanna say good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Brene. And to answer that question, I will say that something that I've noticed about the child welfare system is that they have a tendency of normalizing black children in foster care and black men being incarcerated without even noticing they acknowledge us with the mindset of, We've seen this before and we're not surprised. Did they even take out the time to observe our circumstances? Our circumstances, 
After all, we are living in communities that lack resources to succeed, newer books, newer technologies, school therapists, etc. We have families with preserving issues being passed from generation to generation. So I feel like the first job of the child welfare system will be taking the time to understand the continuous issues with black families and their connection with the welfare system. So they should think in the terms of how can we lower the outcome of black men in prison and black families in foster care? Or what additional resources can we provide to increase the success rate of black families? Also, we as black people play a part in our success too. We have to be more observant of things going on in our families. We have to show that we can that we care about the well-being of our people. How can we possibly expect people to care about honoring our culture and identity if we aren't doing it? Showing care doesn't have to involve money, just simple things like noticing the changes in our moods, taking the time to pick us up and spending a day with us, ensuring to us that no matter what happens, we have family to count on for support. Mm. Renee, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm going to move, I'm going to pivot to Erica. I know that you also have some insights about how the system could implement more culturally competent policies and practices. Could you share those? Uh, yes, I can. Um, you know, I'm just kind of reminding myself to kind of breathe right now. Um, it's interesting for me to even be sitting here uh, having had a previously open case and I want to make sure that what I'm saying is, is impactful for me to remind me of where I am right now. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, is how important it was for my son to be placed in a family that looked like me. The reason being is um, I think of what if I'd had a daughter and for me, an essential part of my being is how my hair is presented um, being able to use lotion regularly is an essential part of me. I can remember going to a CFT meeting and at the time I didn't have the luxury of a parent advocate. I didn't even have the luxury of knowing that was even available to me. Had I known, I would have taken advantage of it. And during that time frame, I remember sitting at the table. I could see my hands and I remember breathing and making sure that I understood every single question that was asked of me and making sure I spoke clearly so you understood everything that I was saying. Because I knew that these three people sitting around the table would make or break the transit, the trajectory of my life going forward. I wish that um, for me, the child and family team meeting would have taken place on a walk in the park I wish they would have spent 24 hours with me. There were things I can't put on paper, but I can explain to you if you just join me in my day and how I do things. Um, I think it would be nice to see a cultural efficacy, not a, this is how things should be, but how do I make myself uncomfortable in order to make this child comfortable in my home? I would like to see that. Erica, your voice is powerful and everyone on this panel's voice is powerful and I appreciate you sharing. As I mentioned earlier, I was in foster care for 18 years and my experience was quite unique. The idea of adoption was pushed on by my great uncle, but he opted to remain a foster parent so that he could continue to receive funding. That funding benefited me and my siblings. And when I aged out of, of the system, I was able to take advantage of the Chafee grant so I can go to college. So Sanika, how do you think the system could make permanency and reunification more family centered? Um, well, we were, we were asked about legal guardianship and adoption even before we got the baby into our home. And so um, I didn't even know what the difference of the two were. And I was not ready to make a decision like, the, like that at that time. I mean, here we were 
We had just sent our 18 year old off or about to send him off to college. And now we are taking in an 18 month old. So my husband and I, I mean, you know, we were, were grandparents. And so we weren't ready to make that decision and we weren't ready to uh, terminate parental rights, you know? So um, I think just not forcing that or, or not even asking that question initially of foster parents. I mean, I get it, but I think that's the, the focus should be, how do we, how can we help the parents? What can we do to help them? Um, even the bridge program, uh, they were calling me the child care, the bridge child care program. They call it, they were calling me and telling me if we open up any discussions about legal guardianship or um, adoption, that child care services would be terminated immediately. Now, both my husband and I work full time. There's no way we're already sacrificing and changing our lives around taking in a baby, but we definitely can't stop working, you know? And so that was very scary for me. I can't afford $1,300 in, uh, in child care. So I think just not so much focusing on uh, trying to make it permanent in the beginning, focusing more on how can we help reunify the family? What kind of information can, can you, do you guys have about the parents where we can help them so that they can eventually get their baby back? Um, the mother, she uh, eventually went to detox and got into rehab. And I've been very supportive of her because I understand that the best place for a child is with their parent, whether it's one of them or both of them. And so she took the steps and got into detox and got into a sober living. She's been clean for about six months now. Um, and we were able to facilitate more visits. I would go pick her up. I made a commitment to go pick her up and bring her to my home and let her spend the day with her baby and then take her back to, to the facility. I was willing to do that because I'm, I'm, we're family. You know? son's best interest that he is placed back with his parents or his mother or his both or his mother and his father or one or both whoever is gonna get it together um and i've always made it clear that i'm not interested in terminating their parental rights at this time people do get it together like we just heard erica say it took her 26 months and 21 days to to get our kid back and so why rush that in the beginning, why even ask that in the beginning? Let's figure out how we can reunify, focus more on that as opposed to, okay, are you gonna be take, are you gonna be able to take the kid? Or, you know, are you in it for the long haul? It just felt like a lot of pressure for us and we weren't ready to answer those questions at the time. Hmm. Sanika, thank you so much for sharing that. You made a point about being able to facilitate visitations with your grandson's mother because you're you're all you're all family and you really wanted the two of them to continue to bond. Erica, while your child was in foster care, was visitation structured in a way that allowed you to stay connected to him? And this is for Erica. Um, <clears throat> with visitation set up in a way that allowed me to stay connected, what I will tell you is no. My visitations occurred three times a week for an hour. I was living in Sacramento. My son's visitations were uh, Howe Avenue and Arden Mall. I lived over about an hour and a half travel via bus and light rail, and I would walk 30 minutes by bus, by bike, by walk, by run. I knew I had to make a visit because if I missed just one visit, the way that I was treated, the way that I was looked at, the way that my son was nurtured to speak to me afterwards, I would make sure I would never do that again. I can remember to this day, um, and I still keep change on me, a dollar and 10 cents to be able to afford an ice cream. My son was four years old. When you have an open CPS case, you have no money. I'm paying for the courses. I'm paying for the travel. I was doing everything. And then I remember 
at the agency, we were in this, what I call the box, small office for 14 months. And I was observed by three people. We couldn't go outside. I was too clean. They just wanted to keep observing me. And I remember I would be in those AOD classes with like other parents and they would say like, I don't know why you're still doing that. You should have unsupervised or you should be able to go to the park. And then I thought to myself at the time, with the little tools that I had, I'm gonna get high again. So I got high again and I was put in a rehab. And then at that rehab, I was allowed to have supervised visits with my son in a living room setting with a child uh, observer. And I can remember my four-year-old sitting on my lap and we were watching, I think something on Disney. And that intimacy that I felt like a mom again, um, when you're being constantly observed, I was my son's playmate for 14 months. That's not facilitating a parent-child relationship. What I will tell you is I had to learn how to be a parent on purpose and not accidentally. And that's a journey that I don't wish on any parent. Monte, if I may just add this too. Um, I, I myself and my husband, we would be willing to um, extend the, the reunification timeline behind, beyond 18 months, as long as the parents are showing progress. Um, this young woman and my stepson, they have been on drugs for a long time, over 10 years. And so it's not going to be an overnight process for them. And so, you know, I think that families, especially Ken and people who can help facilitate more visits and things like that, we should also have a say so in the, the, you know, the reunification timeline and that kind of thing. Thank you both for your insight. Um, the chat is going up right now. Many people are, are saying yes, yes, and, and they're agreeing with your sentiments here. Um, and we have a few questions in the chat that we're hoping to get to a little bit later. I'm sure we'll have time. Let's, uh, let's jump over to Brene. I know that you were eventually reunified with your parents after living with your aunt for a while. Can you talk about some of the challenges that came with reunification? Um, yes, so I feel like everyone has like this picture painted of like what reunification is, bringing a child back to like their parents, which is a goal, but it's not a process that should be, it's, it's not a process that should be rushed. It takes more than like finishing parenting classes and going to rehab. In my opinion, the child and the parent have a lot of self building that they need to do before being reunified. You have to learn to be comfortable around each other so that you're able to come back with the mindset of having a positive relationship. If a child is brought back home too early, they hold a lot of resentment towards the parent, which can create a relapse of unhealthy events. From my personal experience, when I was able to go home, I was so excited. It was something I was longing for, but at the same time, it was something like I no longer wanted. I was like living my life through my parents, being their yes man, because I thought if I listened, it would keep our family together. I was listening to like people who didn't even know me. I was losing myself trying to please people who didn't even know what I wanted to be when I grew up. We rushed the process of being home before we even got the chance to learn each other new selves. My mom saw me as this amazing and smart young lady when in reality, I was, on, I was confused on who I was. I felt alone in a house full of people, ashamed of my looks and feeling the least bit of smart. I mean, the list could go on of so many negative things, but no one knew that. Then for me, I see my mother as someone who no longer cared about the well-being of our, of her family. When in reality, she felt sorry for what she did, and was ashamed, and was ashamed that she let us go through that. She was trying to get her life together for us, but I never knew that because we never talked. It felt like once you get home, whatever went on is like pushed to the back burner and is never talked about or resolved again. Mm. You speak of a lot of nuance, Renee, um, when it comes to reunification and um, it's perspective that we all need to hear and it's a perspective that needs to be added to the conversation. 
So thank you and we appreciate it. Right now, um, I would like to close and I want everyone on the panel to have an opportunity um, to provide us with some closing remarks and I'll center with this question. How would each of you characterize your experience with the child welfare system? And we'll go to Sanika first. I'm um, gonna also wanna let you know that after these closing remarks, we'll have some time for a few questions. Sanika, you could take us away. Um, <clears throat> well, I won't sit here and say that it was absolutely horrible. I can say that we were blessed to have a good team of people that I felt really wanted to see the baby with us, um, but they had to follow the rules. They had to, you know, they had to run their checks and do what they had to do. Um, I, the social worker that we've been dealing with, he's very responsive. Um, he's a very, very good guy. He's always he here for us anytime I call him or text him. Um, he's responsive to our needs, so I can't say that since we've gotten the baby here with us, we've had the help um, that we needed. I just wish that we knew about more resources or if anyone you know, listening on this panel, uh, wh where do we find more resources to help the parents that are struggling? Um, right now, the mother, the mother of the baby is, um, she, is in sober living and she is about to be kicked out of there. They won't extend her time there. So after all these months of her doing relatively well and trying to get this bond together, like where does she go from here? What, what happens? And that's kind of where I'm stuck at um, with her. So I, I'm going to reach out to the social worker. I haven't done that yet, but he normally has some good ideas and we'll see what happens. Thank you, Sanika. We'll move on to Erica and then we'll finalize with uh, Brene and then move into our Q&A. You know, for me, the overall experience of the child welfare system has been for my life, for my son's life, since my case being closed in 2017, it's the rippling effects that have had a profound effect on my family for the rest of my life. I would not be here as a parent advocate. I didn't even know the concept existed. But what I knew was if I went to school and I made enough money for my son to be able to come home to me to get the fingerprinting done by a, a um, that I would be able to get my son home and I would help every parent that asked. My case was open for 26 months and 21 days. I am African-American and Nigerian. It is rare that a black woman gets her child home. It changed the trajectory of my soul. I began PCIT therapy, which is parent-child integrative therapy early on because I earned and I fight for the right to be my son's mother every day, every second, every minute, every hour. Um, the financial, the emotional, the spiritual, the family dynamics have changed. They are forever changed. Um, my nine-year-old freely speaks now and is in therapy and I go to therapy myself regularly, not because of the rippling effects, not because of the traumatic effects, but because I understand the self-care aspects of what um, therapy can provide. I'd like to see that be more integrative early on. Um, what I also will say is I appreciate the system for protecting my son at a time when I was unable to do so. And so in for that, you served its purpose. What I will say is the system is not friendly to parents. It is not designed that way. It is not designed to get children back with parents of color. And so I'm here to say we get our children back I have been clean now for three years. My son is thriving and I am thriving. And um, I am a parent advocate on purpose. So thank you. 
You're giving us chills, Erica. And many people in the chat agree with my sentiments. Thank you for sharing. And we'll move lastly, but not least to Brene. Um, so honestly, it's crazy to think about and like look back on, but I'm grateful for it all, the good and the bad. It has opened up so many opportunities for me, this being one of them. Without it, I wouldn't be me. I'm finally able to see what other people are able to see, the beautiful, amazing, smart, optimistic young lady that I am. Um, it has taught me many lessons, connecting me with so many people that have shown me how to be such an amazing role model like themselves. I cherish this experience because it is what made me who I am. It is what made my story so powerful and worth telling. At a young age, I couldn't see its benefits, but after taking in all the blessings I've received, I would do it all again. In my life, I'm at a point of endless euphoria, so I have no reason to sulk in what happened in my past. After all, the good has outweighed the bad. That really sounded like some poetry that we really needed to hear, Brene. <laughs> and we value it, and we're snapping. Thank you so much. Now we're going to transition into our time of Q&A. Some people have messaged me individually, and I've also received messages from my co-host. And we'll start with the question of, I would like to know from the panelists if any of them had a Black social worker on their case. If not, was one avail? Did they ask for one so that they could have that cultural connection? Did they feel that having a Black social worker would have helped if they had one? How was that experience? That's a long question, but to summarize it, did you have the resources and the connection to a Black social worker? If so, how was that experience and would you have wanted one? Anyone on the panel can, can, can answer this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> actually, I would like to be able to answer that if you don't mind. And that is a microaggression based question. Of course I didn't ask for a black social worker. Are you kidding me? My child was placed with you. I'm gonna do whatever you need me to do. Well, how must I sound? What must I look like? I'm terrified. I didn't even know that was an option. You mean that was an option for me to ask? You're dropping a mic, Erica. We appreciate it. Uh, anyone else on the panel who would like to share their perspective on this question? Um, I will share my perspective. We had all, mostly all black social workers from the lady that came in with RFA and then also the social worker now, he's a young man and he's a black young man. And I just think that we connect, I think that we connect better. Um, I think that we connect better and I appreciate, I just appreciate that I feel more comfortable with him. I do like, I. it's just the trust thing, I guess, but I, I don't know. It just seems like he 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 tries to help and he understands. And not that I I have very good relationships with. Um, I, I'm a nurse, so I work with all races of people, and I have all friends of all different races. But I just felt like in this situation, in this child welfare situation, like having these people who know me and can understand me, it made a difference. I, I felt like they really cared. And they really wanted to get the baby in here with me and my husband. So it helped for us to have that. Thank you, Sonika. And I think Sonika, I think Brene, we appreciate you, Sonika, for sharing that perspective. I uh, think Brene also has something to share on this question. Uh, yes, so I was just going to say like, Honestly, I was so young, so I don't really remember if my um, social worker was black. And plus, like, at the time, I wasn't really like, I feel like I didn't really have like talks with my social worker because I was so young. But I feel like having a, a black social worker is kind of important as a young lady because I feel like losing my mom, someone that's supposed to teach me, you know, like the things of like cherishing like my beauty and stuff like that. I feel like I didn't really have someone to like look up to and stuff like that. So 
I feel like a social worker at times is supposed to be someone that is a positive role model in your life, someone that can you can look up to, someone that can teach you lessons. And like, what better way is it from someone that looks similar to you? Mm. Thank you all. You shared uh, on the continuum of the values and also the, the fears that exist when you're connected um, in this unique way to the foster care system. And who do you look for, for that support, for that connection, for that cultural understanding? So we appreciate you answering the question. I'm gonna move on to the next question here. It says, I'm curious about how child and family teams were helpful for those on the panel. And I think it'd be useful for us to start with um, maybe Erica. Um, what I tell you personally, for me, the child and family team meeting was not useful. I only did it because I knew it was the next step and a requirement for three people to sign off on the next stage of my son being able to come home. I needed to know exactly what they needed from me. I needed it to be detailed. That was the only aspect um, for me personally. Plus it provided me with additional documentation. Because I didn't have my own parent partner, the more documentation, the better. The more organized I was, the better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Erica. Erica, just a follow up, someone asked in the chat, um, how could, how can you make CFTs more useful? How could we make, and this just sounds like someone who's um, in the administration, who's working um, in that area, how can we make the CFTs more useful? The re uh, I think personally, the reality is, let them be known that CFTs are used for the, to progress the case along. Many clients that I have now, and even for me, I didn't even know that CFTs could be done every three months at my request that I should be involved. I didn't even know I still held my son's educational rights. I didn't know. I don't know many times I kept saying, I did not know. The CFTs are supposed to be informational, freely shared information, not a secret. And so they need to start with being that with how they can be useful. Mm. Thank you. Educating everyone. Um, about their use and the resources available and how often they can meet. Thank you for that perspective, Erica. And we'll move on. If, is there anyone else on the uh, panel who'd like to speak on uh, this question? Uh, the CFT meetings uh, have been helpful for, helpful, uh, for us. It, it creates, um, it created an environment of trust where I felt like when we had the first one, the social worker followed through. And I think that's important. And I'm not sure if it's because he he just felt us and and he understood. And then when when we did, we all we had he always calls to schedule them. We've had them multiple times and he follows through. So for us, it has been very helpful because it it helps to identify everybody's needs. And and he makes he made it, he makes it very clear in the beginning what the CFT is about. So Erica, I'm sorry that it, it wasn't, your experience wasn't good with it, but our experience with the CFT meetings have been helpful. We've gotten things done through the CFTs. And I'm not sure if it's just because we have a good social worker or what, but we, the CFT meetings have been helpful for us and we're gonna have another one soon. Thank you, Sonika. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next question here. It says, how do we stop removing children and work on prevention and supporting families so we can keep them home safely? So we, we mentioned a bit of this in, the, in, in, the, in our previous, previous remarks and um, in our testimonies and experiences, but if you all can give some some nuggets of wisdom on this question. I'm sure this uh, this person would find it very useful. How can we stop removing children and work on prevention and supporting families so we can keep them home safely? Um, so I feel like 
something that can be done. I feel like to be more more involved in the lives of Black children, not just because their family is in the system, but just like in general. So like for me, I I was able to have the opportunity to actually not go to a school that was in my neighborhood. And I noticed like so many differences like from the schools, like the schools that I went to, they had stuff like AS, AST prep, different stuff like that, that schools in my neighborhood, they didn't have. My brother, he went to schools where like every day they walked into schools, they had to like go under like a metal detector, like all those type of things. I feel like just bringing more opportunities to schools that are, are not in neighborhoods that are, I guess, more successful, I guess, bring those type of things to like schools like that, that like the different types of resources, better technology, better books, more, I feel like also more staff that are more like, more, more staff that also look like them that are like educated and are willing to help people, more people with positive attitudes. Mm. Thanks, Renee. Um, we appreciate it. And it sounds like you you were saying being able to provide resources where they, they're most needed, uh, right? And that that's the prime definition of equity, <laughs> not equality, the difference between equity and equality. So we appreciate you, Brene. Uh, anyone else on the panel who'd like to speak upon this question. I think one of the, just to kind of piggyback what Brene was saying, like I completely agree with you. There are things that are available within um, the black community that are not readily accessible to us that are available in non-black communities. You know, um, I think the biggest thing is, as you were saying, you know, with the schooling and, and having individuals that look like us and, and just having that cultural, that a cultural awareness, there's a, a word that I'm looking for there and I can't quite find it, is where you step inside the culture and you view the culture from within instead of from the outside, right? So actually living in that area, you can't tell me how I can navigate if you don't even live in my area. If you didn't even grow up the way I grew up. You know, even for me personally, I was raised by a military family. Uh, I had a home birth when I had my son. I am not a TV. These are all things that are readily available because I can go to the library and open a book and read. But this might be wow and amazing. And how did you know there? This is not wow and amazing. These are just options that were available to me because they were readily available for me within my family. And that's how I, I was learned, how I learned these things. Um, so just having like that cognitive awareness, you know, that uncomfortability to be, uh, to be comfortable. It's not my job to make you comfortable, but it is your job to remain uncomfortable so my family can be comfortable. Mm. Thank you, Erica. We appreciate that. Um, is there anyone else on the, on the panel, Sanika, would you like to share on this question or we can move on to the next question, this last question. Uh, this next question will be our last question and then we'll all, we allow everyone to uh, take a, a break from the screens. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question for me again? So I'm making sure I'm staying on task. Mm -hmm. um, it says, how do we stop removing children and work on prevention and supporting families so we can keep them home safely? Uh, I think in our, I can speak in our particular case, I think that if they had given the mother a half of ch a half a chance, she was a foster child herself. She grew up in the foster care system. She does not have any support. She does not have any family. She doesn't have anything. So I think that looking at the whole person, looking at her circumstances, and then not just taking the baby from her, because I think that sent her into a worse spiral downward. And so if they, they had an opportunity there. She reached out for help. She went to a shelter with her baby and reached out for help. And I think at that point, if they had provided her with the services and, and was able to keep her baby with her, um, then she would probably have progressed 
a little different and we might not have the baby here. She, he'd probably still be with, with his mother right now where he should be. Mm -hmm. That's a real, that's a real scenario, uh, Seneca, and a very powerful image for us to see if this would have happened, outcomes may have been different. And that's essentially what this panel is all about, is giving you all the nuances, um, the clarity, the experiences, the knowledge, so that those who are in, who are amongst this program today, can take this knowledge and use it to implement and reform changes. Our last question here, it says, uh, concurrent planning regs must be changed to allow treatment and services to take hold over a longer time period. Systemic racism has helped people back and must be addressed with services that are culturally and racially appropriate. And it goes on to discuss um, if anyone on the panel had an African-American attorney and if they felt that this would have made a difference in the court's eye. Devante, would you mind repeating the first part of that question? I'm not quite, a, I'm not quite understanding what the question is asking. I understand the last part. Yeah, so let's let's skip to the skip the first part and go to the last part because that's where the question was. And so um, I can even start off with this question also because I had an African American attorney um, when I was young. And what was interesting is that when my uncle would go to Arkansas and we would bring back these huge black bags of of pecans and and deer meat, uh, right? Some people call it venison and uh, fish. Uh, when our when our attorney would come and visit us and check out the house and talk with us, my uncle would give him a, a parting gift, uh, a gift. Uh, you know, I'm sure he didn't give he didn't give this to all social workers, but I'm not sure if it was because you know he was so close to us and he he had these expectations that we would succeed. Um, he was a bald man, um, and now that I'm I'm bald, I I you know I'm like I saw myself in him that I didn't see. Um, in the other people that I interacted with among the system, not only because he was African American, but because of his uh, empathy and care that he showed during his visit. And so I'm curious about you all's perspective as well. Did you have any African American attorneys and what that would have made a difference in the court's eye? Um. Just to, for me personally, no, I did not have an African-American attorney. Uh, there was no one on my case at any point uh, that was African-American. Um, for a short period of time, I did have an AOD counselor um, through the STARS program in Sacramento through Bridges who assisted me. But other than that, I never had access to anyone that was African-American. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Erica. Anyone else on the panel? I know that Sonika is uh, keeping a watch out for her, for her daughter. And so uh, we appreciate that. And we understand the, the complexities of being on Zoom and being at home. Brene, do you have any, any insight to this question? She said, no, I don't have any insight to this question. Um, okay, well, we do appreciate it. Here, uh, we're gonna wrap it up. It's 1025. I'm gonna give it back to David to give us some, some more remarks. And then uh, I wanna finalize and say that I appreciate being on this panel with these incredible scholars, activists, advocates, parents. Um, I do know that there's one thing to learn something and it's another thing to take what you've learned and put it into action. And I, I hope that you all can take this information, share it with others and be able to make the changes that we've discussed here and that you know about and that we do research on to really impact the lives 
black indigenous and people of color, particularly in a child welfare system. Thank you so much. And it was an honor moderating this incredible panel. Well, thank you to Demonte, Brene, Erica, Seneca for everything that you shared. I'm just extremely grateful that you were able to be a part of this event. And I'm sure that everyone who's in the audience learned a lot from your stories and your perspectives and also just your analyses of how the child's welfare system currently works and how it could work differently. Um, this is a great opportunity to take a break, as I mentioned before. You know, I know people want to walk around, answer emails, do whatever they need to do. So if you can please be back by 1040 for our next panel, that would be great. We're gonna have a panel featuring people who are working within the system to address the racism and bias, including a, a judge, a social worker, and counsel for parents and children. So yeah, so please come back at 1040 for the next panel. Okay. We have everybody in the Zoom chat for our next panel. Um, so we have a panel featuring a group of practitioners who are working to reform the system from within. Real systemic change will require court officers, attorneys, social workers, county staff, elected officials, and others both inside and out, outside the system to reckon with the past and present racial inequities in child welfare. Our panelists can speak to that truth because they've, they've dedica dedicated their careers to fighting for racial equity and justice. First, I would like to introduce Judge Abby Abinanti. Judge Abby is the chief judge of the Yurok tribe. She holds a doctor of jurisprudence from the University of New Mexico School of Law and was the first California tribal woman to be admitted to the state bar of California. She pre previously served as a commissioner in the United Family Court of the San Francisco Superior Court. Next is Jessica Chandler. Jessica is a children's social worker at the LA County Department of Children and Family Services. Along with her work at DCFS, Jessica draws from her experience as a former foster youth and foster parent to advocate for children and families impacted by the child welfare system. Also joining us is Rachel Ewing. Rachel is a law firm director at Los Angeles Dependency Lawyers Incorporated. As a defense attorney, she's committed to radical child welfare reform by challenging the state of inertia and complacency so prevalent in the child welfare system. Rachel strives to keep families together and minimize the time children spend in foster care. And next we have Phyllis Strickland. Phyllis is the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the Children's Law Center of California. In 1998, Phyllis switched careers. She was a registered nurse and joined CLC as an attorney. She later became Director of CLC2 and currently serves in the steering committee of the Los Angeles County Eliminating Racial Disproportionality and Disparity Work Group. Phyllis believes every person who interacts with children in the court system plays an integral role in understanding and addressing systemic racism. Finally, the moderator of this panel is Thomas Lee. Thomas is executive director of Friends of the Children Los Angeles, a national nonprofit with the mission of breaking the cycle of generational poverty and systems involvement by giving vulnerable children within the child welfare system the ability to create a new story. Previously, Thomas led the Alliance for Children's, children's Rights Opportunity Youth Collaborative which works with community partners to create a launching pad for foster youth to overcome barriers to success. Again, we may have time for audience questions at the end of the conversation. Please share any questions you have in the chat. Thomas, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you so much, David. And uh, thank you to the Alliance and all of the other members that have come together to make this event happen. This is a, a wonderful occasion to talk to some of our peers and colleagues in this work. Uh, I'd like for us to take a second to, to connect and let's do a, a virtual big hug around the children and families we serve and touch in so many different ways and find uh, some possible great solutions that can help us really move forward to transform our child welfare system into a child well-being system. As David mentioned, I don't come to this work new, been doing it for quite some time. And now in my current iteration with the Friends of the Children Los Angeles, have an opportunity to do some preventative work in keeping families together, supporting parenting foster youth, supporting families that have been placed at risk through some of the structural and historical barriers that have kept them from realizing all their hopes and dreams. And so 
Today, we have a wonderful collection of leaders that have been in the movement to reform child welfare. When we think about child welfare, we often only think of a small group of organizations and agencies, and we don't consider all the overlapping systems, such as criminal justice, health and human services, or even education, or even public policy laws and statutes. All these things play a critical role in how our systems function. To move from a conversation about child welfare to a broader one about child well-being, we have to push the child welfare system on some of the following issues. And I'm thinking about acknowledging and reckoning with the history of structural oppression and violence. I'm also thinking about creating trust between systems and communities, preventing unnecessary removals, and making reunification and permanency family-centered. So today, we begin dealing with a vital part of the reform conversation that involves in acknowledging and reckoning with history. The child welfare system is not just one system among many that has perpetuated historical wrongs against Black, Native, and Latino communities. However, some people find it easier to act as if genocide, slavery, and other atrocities happened a long time ago and have little to do with the issues we see in the child welfare system today. And one of my favorite books, it's entitled The Half Has Never Been Told. I think we need to acknowledge that we really don't know the full story of what's gone into creating the places that we see ourselves situated today. And so Judge Abby, I'm going to start with you. Um, how do you bring the idea of historical trauma into your practice? Ayukwe, thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you all. And for the people who are listening, I'm sorry that I, I can't be with you and be able to, to see you. Um, what I The point I wanted to make today was that we have been taught as a system to look at symptoms and current behaviors as opposed to causes and context. And that has kept us from getting solutions because we've done this for decades. And as we can look at the system, it has not helped. And what I do at home now here is make sure that we look at not just interviewing, okay, what kind of behavior has brought you here, but what about your family? What happened to your family? What happened in your family? And knowing what the trauma in your locale is helps you do that. For instance, I know here we had indentured slaves, we had people coming and stealing children for boarding schools, and we had a number of massacres. There are more massacres in this state than in any other state. And I'm talking about massacres of native people. So if you look at that and you go, okay, that wasn't very long ago. Now, I admit I'm fairly old, but in my youth, we actually still had indentured slaves who had run away and come home. They didn't want to talk about it, but we had them. Now, part of the problem of being an indentured slave, and there are many problems with that, is that if you think about it, there's only one way you're going to walk into a mother's home and take her children. You're going to have to kill her. And so a lot of those slaves got to see their mothers killed. And in that process, they're taken, they're removed, they're raised in slavery. When they get old enough, because we weren't really good slaves, they run home. The problem with that, along with all the other problems, is that parenting is one of those skills you learn from being parented. But if you're parented as a slave, you don't have that skill set because you didn't have a parent. You had a slave master. Now that goes down through your family and creates some of the issues that I'm now dealing with. Now that doesn't mean you don't have to deal with the issues because you do, but it's a whole different kind of discussion. If you're talking about here's your responsibility, Abby, and here's this other responsibility and you need to be aware of that and you need to take control of that situation. And you need to say to yourself, and I'm gonna help you learn how to say it, stop now, it stops here. That harm stops right here with me. It's not going on to my children. Thank you so much for that, Judge Abby. Phyllis and Jessica, uh, thank, you for, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, would you mind also sharing some thoughts about acknowledging historical trauma? Um, this is Phyllis, yes. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, and Judge Abinadi, what you said resonates with me. I often hear people say something like, why don't you guys just get over it? Um, why can't we move on? 
Why do you always have to be talking about race, 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 race? I wish we could get over it and move on. But the fact is when you're talking about the level of atrocities that have happened to black people, to other, to in, 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 uh, Native American people, to other groups of people under the name of, I'm saving you, I'm helping you. Um, like Judge Avenatti said, it, it continues on. Not only that, you add to that what's happened in, very, in the very recent past. That's still part of history. You know, these killings, these uprisings that have happened, um, the, the murder of 12 year old, since we're talking about children, Tamir Rice, that's in our very recent past. And that is still a part of us. So does it have a connection to the child welfare system? You better believe it. If we don't understand what happened, what continues to happen and why it affects um, even our speakers today, how it affects them in the here and now, we're being blinded and we will never move forward. Um, it, it, a good example is recently there was a, a mother, I think in Ohio, who was working to take care of her children, but she left her children in the motel. Someone called social services or the police. The police arrested her, put the children in, in, um, in foster care, but they didn't say, hey, what can we do to support this mother who's working and trying to care for their, their children? So we have these historical ways of responding to poverty and racism. And if we don't understand those connections, we're never going to be able to dismantle the system that we're all a part of. Hey everyone, um, just to add another perspective to um, the historical trauma, I think a lot of times from a social you know, welfare perspective, we're trying to stop the cycle. We're trying to heal families. We're trying to change trajectories without giving people information about why they do the things they do. Um, I think a lot of times in the black community, we've internalized unworthiness because, you know, why did I become violent? Why did I cope in this way? But other families coped in another way. When we look at substance abuse, we look at domestic violence, that comes from slavery. A lot of the ways that we've learned to cope come from dental issues of poverty. Um, you know, over hundreds of years that haven't been reconciled. We've never been given equity or equitable opportunities to find other ways to cope, to heal, to deal with um, being in single parent households, to deal with starving a lot of the time, to deal with the violence in our communities and police brutality. We just are told these are the consequences for you coping in these ways, for you stealing from the, for me, stealing from the grocery stores, to have clothes, to have um, food to eat, to take care of my siblings. This is your punishment for being bad. But I never understood why am I so bad? You know, I don't want to be bad. I don't want to hit my kids. Why is that my first instinct is to hit? You know, why am I so violent? I think without giving people the education and just giving them the, the counseling um, or therapy or giving them the drug, the drug treatment program or giving them the parenting class without explaining to them where it comes from, um, it's hard to get over the unworthiness part. A lot of times our parents give up and they kind of just move on. They think they're, my mom always thought that our, her kids were in a better place in foster care because she internalized that she wasn't good enough. It was something internal about her that made her unworthy or unable of, or didn't have the capacity to be a good mother to us. So um, as we think about transformation and we think about healing, let's talk about acknowledging more so the narrative um, of why are we this way? Where do we learn this crap from? You know, where do we learn violence? How do we, why is coping um, solely within, you know, substance abuse and violence? Why, why is that all that we know? Where do we get this from? And I think that a lot of healing can take place when we are able to hold the people accountable who taught us to be this way, who taught us to run right? Or live without our parents or how to be okay without certain things. So just wanted to add that. And thank you guys. Happy to be here. Oh, good to see you, Jessica. And thank you, Phyllis. No, there's certainly not enough time to really deal with that subject in the very best way. And um, because we're under some time constraints, we're going to make sure that we keep kind of go back and forth on that subject because it all is interconnected. And so what I'd like to do, I'd like to get Rachel involved in this conversation. And what I'm thinking about is that when we think about communities that have been harmed by the child welfare system, there are a lot of people who understandably don't trust the system and even fear it. They view the system as an extension of law enforcement and would prefer to avoid interacting with social workers and other county officials at all costs. 
So Rachel, what do you think can be done to improve trust between child welfare agencies and Black, Native, and Latino communities? I think that initially we have to all be willing to accept the reality that there is disproportionality, that racism is real, that this system is damaged, it's ineffectual, and some, are gonna, or some would say that it's doing exactly what it was meant to do, destroy families. We have to change the language, we have to change our intentions from the very beginning. And I say ours because I'm part of this system too, you know? Um, the first contacts with the families can't be uh, this kind of uh, uh, invader kind of mentality, okay? Nobody is gonna respond to that. DCFS is already not trusted in the communities. Police are already not trusted in the communities and it's not by accident, okay? If, if we want to change how families are gonna deal with the system, we have to be different, okay? It has to be about families first. Instead of talking about taking children away, why are we not sitting down and talking to the families and collaborating? They talk about the CFTs, but what about something at the front end where the families are involved, where the, the, the parents are involved, where social services are involved, okay? So we can eliminate having to remove those children at all because we have to acknowledge that these families are traumatized, but all the evidence suggests that taking these children away are going to further traumatize them. So thank you for that, Rachel. Uh, Judge Abby, would you uh, share what you've been doing in your community to get people to engage with the court process and with services? Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Uh, I'm about 50 years too old for these systems. But um, beyond that, I think one of the things that we have really done is say, look, you know you have issues. And if you need help, come and see me and I'll try to figure out how to help you. And we train our advocates and we say, look, we're not gonna call you social workers because it has a bad name. We're gonna call you advocates and what is your main job responsibilities? In our culture, the disciplining was always done by aunts and uncles. So the first thing I tell our people is, you know what to do as an aunt, you know what to do as an uncle, go out there and do it. You know, And if you do that and you come back here, you're never gonna get in trouble with me. And since I'm old and nasty, it's better to not get in trouble with me. So, you know, that's, kind of how, how it works. And you say to them, you know, you can come here and ask for help. You know what's going on. If you need help getting a job, if you need help getting food for the kids, then come and knock on the door and we'll help you. And I'll send somebody out there to work with you. So we have very large wellness calendars now and we let them come to court every two weeks and they help us decide when, when they're ready to graduate. You know, and we have events where they come back and we have meals and then they talk to each other and we try to make them to recreate the village sense because you're what you're looking at with a lot of these cultures is our culture is a very um, rights based culture meaning the united states the state and federal their rights you have a right to do this you have a right to do that well in europe you have a lot of responsibilities you don't have a lot of rights you know so i mean you can you can try telling your grandma, you know, I have a right to remain silent and I'll be happy to help you look for your head because you're not gonna have it on your shoulders for very long. Um, so, you know, that just doesn't work. So if you work with the culture and say, you have a responsibility, how come these kids are out here today? You know, they're not supposed to be out here. You know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna help? How are we gonna get this done? And all you do is the advocate becomes a member of the extended family. And that's the purpose of it, because that's what's been destroyed. And then you talk about things like that. Go, how did how did you get here? 
like I was talking to our police chief and he said, you know what the Yurok word is for police? And I said, I don't think I've ever heard it. He told me, I said, oh yeah, I've heard it. He said, you know what it translates to? I said, I have no idea. He said, it translates to men who steal children because that's the first time we saw police. Now, you know, wait a second. How is that gonna play in your community? Let me call a police officer. So thank you for that. Thank you for that, Judge Abby. Uh, Jessica, and then we're gonna get Phyllis to follow up. But Jessica, from the perspective of a social worker, you are, you have committed your, li your life uh, to give in the form of service as well as a foster parent. What changes do you think would make families more willing to ask for help? Um, I think if it was uh, more built into our community already. Um, I was talking earlier about, um, you know, we have California State Preschool out here where it's free for um, low income families to get, I think it's three hours that they can send their kids to um, school where they're being enriched and they can, you know, learn some ABCs or how to play positively and share, but it's only for three hours. And it's, but if you have money, you can send your kids to preschool, maybe till six o'clock or however long you need for that day. A lot of times prevention, I think is um, when you're looking at families who are under extreme environmental press, they are, um, you know, it's a lot of stress in the home. There might be a lot of drugs going on in that community or several families sharing a household. It's really hard for, you know, them to manage stress, but if they had somewhere to send the kids, if it was really about the kids and reduce the maltreatment, and we just want to make sure that as much time as possible, they were somewhere where they were being enriched, where they were receiving proper supervision and nutrition, then we would extend things like um, California State Preschool or um, kindergarten or the after school programs, right? It would be available to everyone till six o'clock and it wouldn't be based just on income because only certain families would probably send their kids. I think if even thinking about WIC, um, you can get free milk and eggs and bread and fruits and vegetables for your kids. Um, up until age five, right? But after that, it's like, do they no longer need nutrition? You know, or do they no longer need access, you know, to these things? If it was just a, a norm that everyone deserves access to healthy food, anyone who needs it, right? Because only certain people are going to go to WIC, only certain people are going to access um, free programs and different things. But if, it, if we didn't put an age limit on it, would we be able to reduce incidences where teachers and mandated reporters are calling? And especially like there's um, a lot of pantries where I live where they have clothes or they have um, detergent and household cleaning supplies. You can get a broom and a dustpan. If this was just very community-based at anyone without having a welfare card or some type of approval, if you needed something, it's here. On this corner, everyone goes here when they run out of detergent. We need milk, what has it. If it was just ingrained into the community that we care and everyone should have access to clean, safe environments and food and nutrition and safe places to take their children, then we wouldn't have a need for a child welfare system. Or at least not as, we would have more extreme cases to deal with. I wouldn't be going to the schools when the kids didn't have socks on. Because even the teacher herself would go get a 10 pack, right? From around the corner. So I think that um, trust is built when we believe that our community cares about us. When the police officers that are showing up and the social workers that are showing up are educating the te teachers that don't call me, next time I want you to go right here to this food court or whatever it would be called or this location that we have. And I want you to go get something for your community, for this kid in your classroom. We don't need to be involved in a lot of, you know, it's over 80% of our cases are general neglect. A lot of them are BS and a lot of them are racist. The phone calls because someone else who looks, who has exact same situation or worse, I won't get the phone call. So if we can just build into our, if, if we reallocate those funds, defund the child welfare system, sorry for saying that, but let's say we, re, which just means redistribute or imagine taking the how much right now I have a placement, $14,000 a month for them to be in this group home. These kids, once they get past age 12, they don't get better. They get, they're more hurt. They internalize unworthiness and, and being unlucky people, un, unworthy people. They just, they just, just more hurt people as they become teenagers and go on into our society. If we were to reallocate even half of the funding that we put into this system and to our communities, there will be trust that when there is a kid that's detained, we would all believe that kid must need to be detained. It must be something really going on in that home because we know in our community, in our society, that there's access to 
food and clothes and cleaning supplies and kids get moms can get diapers if they just show up then no one has to be good enough no one has, you can be rich and go exploit it if you want to we want to make sure anyone who needs these things that we consider needs has access to it and i think that i would believe even as a social worker when i got a referral that you know what this is a serious case let me get out there and see what needs to be done but until, but right now it's, it's very blurry, a lot of our cases. So I don't know, that's my, that's my, that's how I feel. Thanks. Phyllis? Ooh, Jessica, yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, think about what Jessica just said. Trust is earned. Trust is earned when people see that you follow through with what you're gonna do. Where is that money? Is there money in the community to support these families? And it would be great if every case that came into court, we knew it was something going on, but that's not the case. The other, that's not always the case based on what Jessica said and what we see. But another piece of this is accountability. Um, we have to, you know, I, I trust someone because they've shown me that they are trustworthy. If the system shows you that it is trustworthy, if the court shows you that they are trustworthy, if the attorneys show you that they are trustworthy, then you can begin to, to connect with them and work with them and say, maybe they do have some knowledge and some best interest that I can um, take a hold of so that I can get my child out of out of, out of the system. Or a child can say, I'm gonna be okay because I trust this attorney, this social worker, because every time they've worked with me, they followed through on exactly what they said. And even when it hurt, they told me the truth. Even when I didn't like it, they were honest with me. I can trust that person. What we don't have, in my opinion, is what often happens is, now I'm talking about as a system as a whole, we, we find something that works like family finding, um, you know, front end, people are talking about the front end work and it's working to find family in the beginning. One of our speakers earlier on talked about that. She wished that the system had spent more time looking for family. So if that's working, why isn't, wor why isn't it ingrained in every single office? Why isn't it in every single court report? Why isn't it in every single lawyer is asking for that? Every judge is saying, what's happening with that? Um, so I, I find that when we, we start off on something fancy and then we divert ourselves as some other something that we go to. And people say, well, I, I, I can't trust you all because you never follow through as a system, as an organization with what you said you were gonna do. So accountability. If we each hold each other accountable, forget if I offend Jessica or if Rachel offends me, you know, we'll be okay. We're adults, we'll be okay. But I need to ask Rachel the hard questions as, as um, counsel for parents. Rachel, did, you know, is this gonna happen? Do you have the, re does that parent have the resources? My child client, wants the reunification. What's going on here? What do we need to do to make this better? Oh, love that. Thank you both Jessica and Phyllis for that. You know, I wanted to stay on this topic a little bit because if we're gonna really look deeply and how can we prevent unnecessary removals, we do have to look at who are all the different players in our child welfare system. And uh, there was a presentation that I saw recently done by uh, Chapin Hall, where they looked at national child abuse, the national child abuse and data, data, data um, child abuse and neglect data system to point out how um, teachers represent the largest portion of systems that are reporting children uh, for suffering with, for maltreatment. And what's interesting about that is that, and at the same time, those particular uh, investigations that are triggered only yield about 11% of real cases. So more than any other group, teachers are initiating these investigations into families. And much of what teachers are detecting are service needs that do not require investigative responses. This is just one way we know that there are a lot of families being investigated on bad information. So Jessica, going back to you for a second, 
besides changing mandatory reporting policies, what are some other ways to prevent families from becoming involved in the system? What could social workers do to prevent unnecessary removals? Um, hopefully I'm not jumping ahead, but I think this is my cue to talk about restorative justice. So um, a lot of times when we get a referral, not only do we know if your mom had a case, but we know if your grandmother had a case with us too. So we know that whatever services we offered your family, as far as a parenting class, a full alcohol and drug treatment program or domestic violence 56 week class, we know it didn't work because guess what? We're back at your door and we're coming for your baby, right? So if we know that we, and, and as someone said earlier, we know the greatest trauma that a kid experiences is being removed from their, um, Oh, my video went off, I'm sorry guys. The greatest trauma is being removed from your parent and that whatever intervention we had in your life or in your family's life didn't work, don't come to anyone's door without something extra. Like don't come to this child's door that you detained. And clearly the same, and a lot of times you guys, I promise you it'd be the same exact reason why we detain the child from the mother. So if it was substance abuse with the mother, not only is it substance abuse with the daughter or the son, it's the exact same drug. It's like not even getting creative or exciting anymore. It's the exact same things being passed down generation after generation, and we haven't made a dent in it. We haven't made any change. So we come, we know that since grandmother had a case and great grandmother, that there's no place to even put this child outside of foster care. There will be no re relative placement because no one even took her in, right? She aged out of foster care in our system. We know all this information, but we don't come to their door with housing or some place to do their program at. We don't say, hey, you know what? We've seen you had a case with us before and you were in foster care with us. And we know if we take your baby, you'll never see it again. We know that we won't be able to place with family or anything like that. So let's come to you. We're gonna to come to you and offer you a program where you can safely get, you know, go through whatever um, needs to be done to keep the kids safe with housing, with child care, with access to medical care. We're going to make sure we're connecting you to whatever the resources that you may need so that you can successfully um, start working through healing through whatever trauma it is that we didn't help you with. So I think that um, it's, it's really unfair that we just go to the homes and detain with all the information that we have. Um, when we meet the families. And I think that if there was something in place, if there were more housing programs that even if DCFS wanted to take it on their, themselves and say for former foster youth who we run back, if we come back into your life again, we are sorry. And we are so sorry that not only are we gonna come, we're gonna make sure that you have housing, electricity, and that you have food in the fridge and that you, there's childcare. And so that even if your baby has to shake for three days while they overcome the meth addiction or the crack or whatever it is that they must suffer through, we're not taking your baby because taking your, your baby doesn't work. It's never going to work. So let's stop just detaining. We have to come with more to the table than just more pain. We can't keep punishing them for failing them. Whenever a family is coming back to our attention after they've been a child, in our system, we have failed. There has to be something more than just taking their children. We even have the data that right now we know that 40% of our former foster youth, their children are coming back. We know it right now. We don't even have to wait for those babies. They're on their way. 40% of the cases that we have right now are on their way back. Attorneys, social workers, judges, they're coming right back. Right now, they're on the way. So what are we going to meet them with? Hey, you failed. No, you, we didn't fail. Y'all failed. You failed to reconcile whatever brought them to the department's attention in the first place. And now you're gonna keep punishing them while we're continuing to make all this money. So if there has to be something put in place. People have to take it seriously, the data that we have and the information that we have at the door. Before we meet the families, we know a heck of a lot of information that we don't tell them. We don't come to the door and say, oh, we know your mama had a case and your grandma had a case. And we know that this has been prevalent in your life for looks like 40, 50 years. And so we have something, if you'll, if you'll let us help you, if you'll try to trust us one more time, we're not just, we don't want to just take your kids. We want to help you heal. We have something more for you. So it has to be something equitable. And I'm going to keep saying the word equitable because it's not fair to keep giving people, these hurt people that we failed the same resources and services as the new cases that are coming to our attention. No, so. I love that. love that. Thank you, Jessica. Love that. Makes me think of uh, some of the things you're talking about. A um, some new incredible initiatives happening around Los Angeles County now with uh, 
um, being led with the mantra of care first systems last. And I think this is where we're starting to make a turn, an important turn in how we, we work with children and families across the county. Rachel and Phyllis, you know, she, uh, Jessica brought up the role of attorneys. And from your perspective as legal counsel for parents and children, what do you think can be done to keep families together? Well, let's see, I'm gonna pull out my wand and I'm gonna change the whole darn thing. Uh, I think, you know, we have to start at the very beginning, all right? If we're being candid and we're being honest, we've got a bunch of judges who are, are sitting there who are inexperienced, they know nothing about child development. They know they have no psychological background. They've had no anti-bias training, uh, anti-racist training, nothing. And, and, and the majority probably didn't even want to be there in the first place. Those are not the people that our families need to meet first, you know? And I agree that the cases that need to be coming to court need to be our more serious cases, not the cases that we've already uh, provided services for and stuff like that, but the, the cases that there's nothing we can do but fight, okay? And I'm not saying that there aren't any solutions or no settlements, okay? But there shouldn't be because uh, the parent was standing outside of Vons trying to get money, uh, food for their kid. That, that's not the case that we should be seeing in court. Also, when we're at in court, we need to be able to work together. Okay, the social workers need to talk to the attorneys. Uh, the, the, our social workers need to be able to talk to the county social workers. It, that needs to happen. And however we make that happen, at least I'm saying for the first, mm, let's say the first year, those are the efforts that are, are being made. Everybody is on the same page about reunifying the family and all efforts and all, all energy is put towards that. How can I help this family get back together? We're missing that part of it, especially in LA County, which I've already talked to you guys about. I mean, we all know it's liability driven. It can't be just kicking the can down the road. The ER worker goes out and they kick the can down the road to the court and the court you know, says, oh, you know, I'm going to kick it back to the Department of Children and Family Services. And they say to the families, well, you know, if you want this resolved, your attorney is going to be fighting really hard for you. That's the same attorney who's got like 200 cases. The chances of the high quality representation that they deserve at this point, not going to happen. And not only that, those numbers don't just affect the attorneys. They affect the judges. You cannot deal with these issues in five, 10 minutes and send the parents on their way. It's just not possible. So we have to make some really, really hard choices. And I think that we can have the numbers where we can help families if we take the neglect out of it and just deal with the abuse cases by the time they come to court. Okay, I'll get off my box. And I'll get on your box. All right. <laughs> and I want to talk from, um, you know, Jessica talked about the cases that are coming back, but there's cases right now in the system. And let me make this clear what's happening right this minute. So we represent, Children's Law Center represents minors. The, those children are in the system to, from no fault of their own. Some of those children, while they're in the system, get pregnant. And they, some boys, some girls, and, they, and the, the girls have babies. And one would think that that nurturing and that care that, um, and compassion that we're gonna give to the child, even if, and it shouldn't be, but if, the, if one says that the system is punitive against parents, it shouldn't be against the child, right? So if this system is child-centered, now we're, we've been taking care of this child, not doing a good job, but nonetheless, that's the role of the court. And so this child now has a baby. What happens when that child has a baby? All of a sudden, that role switches. And the compassion, sometimes what we're seeing, the compassion that went toward that child 
now that they're a mother or becoming a mother, it's like, oh, hands off. You want it to be grown, you know, and this is a type of language. You want to be grown, you want to be an adult, we'll treat you like an adult. Well, they're not an adult, they're a child. Developmentally, they're not at the same place that an adult is. And someone mentioned earlier, they have not learned acquired parenting skills, but the court will now, if that child, before they even talk about the child being detained, if the department does a, a risk assessment that, oh my gosh, we must detain this baby from the mother, the child mother, the minor mother, the non-minor dependent mother. Um, so that cycle, how can that cycle be broken? How can we support that baby with this newborn? One way, one thing that's not always happening and it should be happening is the department knows that that child has a lawyer. But that department may not be going to that lawyer and saying, hey, I want to talk to your client. I'm going to be doing a risk assessment. We're thinking about detaining. So there are things we could do right now and we should be doing right now to protect the youth that end up in care because those numbers are great. The number of children that are having children are great, but what support is there for those um, children? So again, it goes back to what Rachel and all of you all are saying. If we're not working together and holding each other accountable, um, we're, we're just perpetuating this system. Mm. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank and, you. And, and one thing I'll add, I think about my daughter, I'm a grandma, and I think about my daughter when she was pregnant. She had her husband and, you know, to go through that, um, that those, those months with her. And she had him there and actually had me there when she had the child. Think about our children who have no one with them during this very traumatic time. They're not at home. They're not with relatives. They're in foster care or STRTP or some such place that we all think are all wonderful, but it's not within a family. And so that child now is having this baby, maybe no one's in the, the maternity room with them, the delivery room with them, and then they go home. I think about, again, my daughter, how much work it was. You know what, my daughter and her husband lived separately, but they wanted to come stay with us when they first had that baby. My daughter figured out, oh, this is gonna be a hard transition, I need some help. But we were there, but who's there for the, these, these young mothers, these young fathers? No one is there, but they've got now, a, their, babe, their baby is detained, they've got a play, case plan that's ridiculous. How do we expect them to comply and not have that baby removed from them? So we, we've got to break the cycle and there's ways we can do it if we want to, if we choose to, if everyone is educated to do it and we all agree to do it and again, hold each other accountable. And sorry to, uh, I know I'm all on everyone's time, but I want to know if, it, you know, people are interested in expanding programs like Nurse Family Partnership, where they're coming into the home. And, you know, for me, it was a life changing program to just learn about the development of the baby, yes. um, what to expect. Um, and even after I brought my son Noah home, she, she's the one who helped me latch him on to breastfeed. She's the one who was there when I was nervous. She was watching me for signs of postpartum. She was watching me, you know, yeah. to see if there were any other services or referrals she could give me. And it's only a two-year program, but I can imagine that program expanding to where they can come in the home more often for the teenage moms who have no one or even stay with the families longer than the two years if you know the teen wants it but there are things that exist that work well that are we have a lot of evidence um that they make a difference um that you know I just want to put it on everyone's radar thanks I just wanted to add to to what Jessica just said that if you start developing programs that are modeled on families as opposed to nuclear families you're going to get a lot further because humans need humans that's all there is to it. And the whole notion of, okay, we're gonna be a nuclear family has wrecked the joint. I don't know what else to say. We didn't come from societies like that. We didn't come from cultures like that. And going to it has not been a real great idea. 
No, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So as we near the end of the conversation, I know there's a lot of great comments coming in through the chat. Please, if you have a question that you want to ask a member, any one of us on the panel, please put it in there. We'll try to see if we can fill as many as possible. And so I think we ought to spend a little bit of time of how the different ways children and families exit out of the system. Right now, as soon as the county places a child in out of home care, they ask caregivers if they would one day consider a guardianship or even adoption. Clearly there's a focus on moving kids out of the system as quickly as possible, rather than giving families the time and resources to find a solution that works for them. Judge Abby, again, I wanna go back to you to keep you to keep you talking and sharing and, and, and imparting some of your wisdom. Can you talk about tribal customary adoption and how it's more family-centered permanency, a, a more family-centered permanency option? Well, we, we have worked out with the state a plan where we allow adoptions without termination. Um, and that also provides for the children to have continued relationship with their parents. And that's part of the program. Because sometimes you just can't parent because you've just had too hard a go. Or it's going to be a long time. You know, I do, I will do guardianships. And at the same time, I'm doing a guardianship offer the parent a wellness program. And that wellness program makes take two or three years. At the same time, that parent is still engaging with the child. And I've had people come back and say, you know what, she's better now. I think you should just send baby home. He's not a baby anymore. You know, so part of it is, how do you have communities step up, you know, and stop the harm? And one of the things I was gonna say is that it's partly is how you ask questions. And in the reunification plan, you have to add sections like culture, what are you doing to reconnect them with their culture? What is their culture? Like family, what are you doing to create a family? People cannot move without those things. They just can't. You know, and it's not, it's not significant to people. So they don't pay any attention to it. You know, it's significant to me because I want to know when I see a child or somebody in wellness, which dance family do you belong to? Why didn't I see you at dance? You know, do you fish? Did you give the first fish you caught to elders? You didn't? Who's been talking to you? You know, so you have to have that cultural component so they have a way to hook onto the world. You know, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So we spend a lot of time with that is how do you reconnect people and also trying to, to limit the harm. I mean, I've been doing a lot of work with missing and murdered Indian women and children and California's fifth in the nation for that. And you know what question they never asked? I looked at the list and I looked at our list and I went, you know what? How many of those women who were dead and missing had their children taken? A huge number and nobody ever asked that. You know, so you've got to look at these things and you've got to look at them critically. Because, you know, once I saw that I went, oh my God, you know, we have got to move on that. And then helping people heal from that. How does a child heal from that when they lose their, their mother or their sister that way? Right. You know, it isn't about some things you can't reconcile, but you can heal if you admit them and move. Thank you that for that, Judge Abby. Rachel and Phyllis, um, from your perspective, from your perspective as attorneys and the non-tribal welfare system, what lessons do you think we can draw from uh, the, tri the concept of tribal customary adoption? Yes, I um, had never heard that concept and um, it just made me pause a bit uh, to, e to even consider it because that's not the way I learned about adoption and termination of parental rights. When, when, when the welfare, um, the 2-6 hearing happens where there's termination of parental rights, um, speaking from a personal perspective, is very chilling to me, even after practicing for law all of this time. When you have a parent there and the judge makes that, starts reading off the findings and terminates the rights, um, parents some cry, some run out the room, um, but it's always very chilling to know that emotionally 
that you're severing a relationship, even if you believe it should happen or not. So this concept is, is I, I appreciate it. And I, I wanna read more about it and think more about it. Um, but the other piece of it is a colleague of mine, Heather Wilson, has recently been teaching some a seminar on, um, she's an attorney and she was adopted. And she talks about how we in the system forget about all the players when there's an adoption, unlike what um, Judge Abinadi is talking about. We forget that there's a response to that, um, all of the family and all the systems and that child that they've been in. And it might be nice and clean for us in the court. It's done, let's move to, you know, let's move it along to the next case. But it's not so um, simple. And so I, there's gotta be a, you know, for me, uh, dismantling means a lot of relearning, unlearning some of the things I've learned unlearning some of the practices that I've just taken for granted because this is how I was taught to do things. You know, <clears throat> when I was, I, I, I have to join Phyllis in that. I, I was not aware of that. Um, I of course knew about uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act, but I wasn't familiar with um, the tribal adoptions. But for me, it's, it's not really that big of a, a leap because really we're supposed to be doing um, something that's good for the family, that's positive for the family. So if that, if that design is something that works for the family, great, because adoption uh, reverberates all through the family. My son, uh, went back and uh, tried to reunite his family. You know, it was incredible to see. He was determined to do this. He was determined to get his younger siblings. Um, but of course there were uh, siblings who had been adopted, their names had been changed. Um, so he didn't have a relationship with them. And I only mentioned that because I was so struck um, at how fragmented his family was uh, at, at that, at, after, you know, all of this had gone on, there were like uh, eight children and they were all in different uh, spots, but he was very determined. But I think that if we came up with something, we came up with something other than the finality or the, uh, the end that comes after a two six hearing, for some families, for some, for, for other uh, families, you know, that's what, that may work. I don't know. Um, but for them not to have relationships with anybody else uh, in their biological family is tough. It's very, very tough because it, they don't stop being part of that. Well, and I think in many cultures have ongoing responsibilities to their ancestors, you know, and if the children don't know how to exercise those or how to take benefit from it, it's really hard on them. How to get strength from them. How do you move past that? You know, like in a dance culture like ours, you dance with certain portions of your family, you know, so are you foreclosed from that? How do you adjust that? And how do you heal when somebody has gone on, has gone to the next place, has, has walked on to the next world, how do you heal that with them? You know, and how, how do you do that? And how do you rejoin so that you can go forward together? Because eventually you know, okay, I'm going to go there too. And I don't want to have this estrangement. You know, so there's all these things and it depends culturally on, on what you believe. And I think Try the whole melting pot thing was such a fiasco also, you know, okay, you get to be an American and we're going to forget everything that you ever were for the last 5,000 years. I don't know who came up with that genius idea, but you know, it's not really helpful. It just isn't. I think that um, someone wrote it on the group chat. I saw like a piece of it. Um, I, I believe adoption out of foster care should all have to be open. And we appreciate everyone who wants to adopt out of foster care. 
um, we're going to pay for it for you and all that, you know, make the process really nice, hopefully. But the truth is, without knowing that birth story, with not understanding where you come from, healing really can't take place. These kids are growing up and having even physical and genetic things that they're having to deal with without without understanding where they come from. So some of it, I think, is spiritual, like the judge was saying, but some of it is like physical characteristics. Like, where does, why do I have this? You know, and where, where do, who am I? You know, and I think that a lot of times they need, it's a lot more to reconcile than just, oh, my mom didn't want me or wasn't able to take care of me. Like, what, there's a lot more. So I think that's just something very interesting to really consider that adoptions all should be open um, out of foster care. Would you say that even if we're going to have fewer people exiting uh, that way? Through adoption, if we'll have more? Fewer. People, if people will say, well, I'm not going to adopt if it has to be open. I'm not going to deal with that family. So we have well, more kids remaining. Well, it's care. really about the foster kid. It's not about, we're, I'm sick of doing things that, the, that make the adults comfortable. To be honest, I'm sick of it. Um, if we're all here to support the well-being and best interests of the children, those are the kind of people we need to be foster parents, adoptive parents, and legal guardians. Um, tired of accommodating and begging people to help us with these kids and paying them a double yeah. D rate and a triple D rate and an upside down D rate and a crisscross applesauce rate to take care of our kids. If you don't have the heart to do this, you're not appropriate. You're not appropriate. These kids are not the best shiniest kids. They have a honeymoon period on them where it seems that way for about a month. But after that month is up, they're coming for you. So if you don't have the heart to do this, if you don't sign up for this, you shouldn't be here. Social workers, foster parents, attorneys, judges, all you guys need to quit. We need to pay the people who want to be here a little bit more. And that's it. And, you know, I, I think people need to get out of their head this notion that these kids don't know about each other. They know, they know about each other. Okay. So, I mean, I just listened to an argument where the older kid was going to be placed uh, someplace else and the younger babies were going to be adopted by their foster parents and but they they're all living together now they all grew up together and i'm thinking to myself what in the world are they thinking how could they possibly be arguing this how could they think that this is good for this family um so i i'm sorry i agree with jessica absolutely 100 percent. i'm team go away this <laughs> is a this is a special section we're working with special individuals and these kids when we when we do finally touch them, when we finally reach them, they do things in this world that other people can never do. Their survival threats is exponential. The things that me and my sister Charity, who I saw is on here, have been able to accomplish because of what we got to survive, because there's nothing else behind us to look to look back at. We only can go forward. So when you finally tap into us, there is so, so much greatness that we can achieve. So don't take that from them. Don't take their foster care story from them. Don't take what they've had to survive from them. Because even though they're four years old when you adopt or two years old, they've had to survive something sometimes even in the womb that they're unaware of. And they're survivors. They're resilient. They're triumphant. They're going to be our next world leaders. And they, they're going to grow up and make a difference if they are able to see that as a strength. So we need to make sure that we're surrounding them by people who are able to counsel, inspire, empower, and uplift them help them heal so that they can do whatever their purpose is. A lot of times we think that because we go through bad things, that that's not part of our purpose. You have to overcome things and make mistakes in order to reach your full potential. Their journey, even though it's sad for us adults and we, we feel so hurt by it, it's directly tied to who they're going to become also. This is part of their journey too. Their birth story, who their parents are, is tied to their destiny. And it's okay. We just got to help see, see them through it, guide them through it, and love them through it. So that they see it the way that we see yeah. them. And part of they their experience. Are, they also have a purpose. Oops. I'm sorry. Part of their experience isn't just this few years because they also own the 500 years before that. And those people who got them to this were strong. Yes. And they need to understand that because none of us made it except for the fact that we had strong ancestors, period. Because they came for us you know, and we made it. And they need to understand that. This last little bit is just that last little bit. And you know, don't think that people don't know how to do it. They do. You know, they we've got people who are out there and they're committed to these kids and they understand that these children's families are important to them and they make sure it happens. So when you hear things about 
oh, you know, the parents are trying to have visitation on the foster parents' time. Mm -mm. They know how to do it. My kids stayed with a woman who was a foster parent. And I would see the, the mothers who um, were having, who were drug addicts and whatever, visiting their children on her front porch, in the front yard, no problem. It happened. She even ended up adopting some of them because it doesn't always work, okay? But it can happen. People can be committed to this work and, and facilitate reunification. That's a beautiful yeah. exchange, beautiful exchange, ladies. Um, I hate to cut that off, but we do, we do have a couple of questions. There's a, an amazing uh, response is coming through the chat and I'm trying to track some of them. So I'm gonna ask some of the organizers uh, that are supporting us with this, if there's some really good questions bubbling up that we wanna make sure that we address while we have everyone here assembled, please make sure you um, shine a light on them so I can make sure I ask. Uh, one that definitely jumped out that I was able to capture, and this is from the audience, and this is for anyone on the panel. How do you think mandated reporting laws impact families' ability to ask for services they need? And what can we do to address this as a potential barrier? So you mean like when a family's talking to the teacher about what's going on in her home, there might be some domestic violence issues, or she just lost her job. That's why the kid's not getting to school on time, her car broke down. Um, a lot of times when they're looking for help, the mandated reporters call on a referral. I think that's, that's right. what you're yes, talking about. Right. Absolutely. And um, there's nothing in place to, to say who's a victim, right? There's just this there's situation and then the hotline are the people who are supposed to interpret whether or not this is abuse or neglect. So I think that the mandated reporters aren't going to have that, you know, power for the interpretation, but there is something that can be done at the hotline level when those calls are coming in, because we are, the hotline social workers are all CSW3s. That means they're seasoned workers, and they're supposed to be able to interpret what's bullshit and what's an actual issue. So when you get to that level, it's really those people who are fielding those calls who need to be trained or, or need to have built into their tool, because we have a tool right, that we use when those calls come in. They need to have something in their tool that can acknowledge and respect that someone is reaching out for help. And um, that's the only suggestion I could think is that it would have to happen at the hotline level as the calls are coming in from all over and that um, it can be, maybe be built into the tool to where we're not um, dinging these people who need help. That there might be a way that we have i remember when i worked at the alliance if there was a service that we didn't offer them we would just automatically refer them to bid setting like we don't do this but they do like this isn't you need housing go here and so we didn't just send the moms and the families away we sent them with a whole referral and warm handshake to who could help them so there has to be a way that we can connect them to community resources and support and be and that should be our jobs as social workers um, at that level and I think that there, there some has kind to be a way of, to be done. Some kind of programming with the teachers, hmm. you know, because if that's a big entry place and they're screwing it up, then if you if they each had like a list of 27 resources hmm. and they could give it to the parent, you know, and then after that, if it didn't, you know, if there was an issue, then that's a separate issue. But what you're talking about is people who don't have access to resources because of the way we've set up this whole melting pot nuclear family thing and it's embarrassing to ask for help because I don't know, but you know, but if you created it as not an embarrassment and here each teacher has this card. Oh, here, this is, here's a whole bunch of resources. Try these. Do you need a phone, you know, to help you, whatever, you know, that would help too. That would cut down on the number of hotline things and just yeah. let the teachers, instead of being the ones who then because then all you've done is alienate the parent from the school and pretty soon the kid's not going to school no more. Because who wants to send their kid to school if you're gonna lose your kid at school? I mean, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. And mandated reporters like all of us need to have continued education about right. racism. We've gotta, we've gotta have this education. We've gotta talk about it, everybody. They've gotta talk about it. Um, there was a recent study where uh, children in preschool were being identified as problematic, uh, more so the boys of color than other children. What? Come on. 
So what, you know, we're, we're normalizing racism or it's normalized. Let me put that in the past tense. No, there's just one thing I'll add. Um, some great research done by the um, USC School of Social Work looking at how um, many of our young parents, our parents in general, are coming into contact with so many different systems. And as they come into, to, to come into contact with multiple systems looking for help, those are, of course, are the ones that are hyper vigilant about making reports about how they're caring for their children. And so in their search for support, it ends up leading to a dead end where they become they come even greater exposed to their children being come, become exposed to the foster care system. So it, it is a terrible dynamic where all of these systems overlap one another and reinforce some of the issues that all of you have uh, elucidated in the most beautiful way today. Um, I am going to, I think we ran a little bit over time and appreciate all the lively discussion. There was some links that we put in the chat if you're interested in learning more about the study from Chapin Hall. Certainly be happy to even share the information uh, that comes out of the great work done by the uh, School of Social Work at USC about all the different cross cutting cro the intersections of different systems that parents are trying to get connected to, especially in foster care. And then lastly, I want to thank this incredible panel. I thank you for being honest and your authentic selves. And I also want to thank everyone for hel helping bring us together. We have to do this more often and of course take a little bit more time so we can go deeper. There's still so much more, like I said, the half is, has yet to be told. And so this is an opportunity for us to keep on fighting. If we're gonna, if we're gonna fight a pandemic, let's fight the other, the other major viruses that keep us from you know, realizing our full humanity. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to David and thank you again, everyone for joining us today and being a part of this great conversation. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you to Judge Abby, Phyllis, Jessica, and Rachel. That was incredibly illuminating. I wish we had another hour to hear you all share your perspectives and your and your insights. And what I really heard from that was a really a loud challenge to not get bogged down by the structures that currently exist in the child welfare system and try to imagine a system that functions in a really radically different way. Um, so thank you again. Uh, before the summit, we sent you a, dr a draft report containing policy recommendations for addressing the racial inequities in the child welfare system. Um, now that we've heard from those directly impacted by the system, as well as people working to reform the system from within, I'm gonna spend the next 25 minutes or so walking us through each of those policy recommendations. Let me just share my screen. Okay. So we've been, we've been developing these policy recommendations, this blueprint for reform with, in collaboration with advocates, with people like uh, those on, our, on both of our panels, um, people directly impact, impacted by the system, you know, all of these important stakeholders. Um, no, a number of these reforms have been implemented in places around the country, and they've shown a lot of promise. So as just to kind of set the, um, you know, just, level set, data show that Black, Native, and Latino children face disparities at nearly every stage of the child welfare process. Maltreatment reports, investigations, case substantiations, out-of-home placements, family reunification, termination of parental rights, and time spent in foster care. This is why reforms are needed at every decision-making point in child welfare, and even before children and families come to the attention of the system. So we've divided these policy recommendations into three categories. The goals of each category are as follows. Valuing family and community through prevention strategies, empowering the family network and connecting youth to their community, and prioritizing family decision-making and preferences when considering permanency and reunification. So these categories refer to three distinct stages in the child welfare process, before a child enters care, after a child has been placed in care, and when a child is exiting the system. There are 17 of, the rec of these recommendations in total. I know it's a lot, you know, some of these get, get really into the weeds. So later today during the afternoon session, you'll have the chance to unpack a subset of the recommendations. Um, and also we created a survey. So you'll have another opportunity to give some feedback at your leisure. So this first um, category of recommendations 
they pertain to the front end of the system. During the first panel of the day, Demonte Thompson, he talked about how, <clears throat> he talked about his own experience in foster care and how you know, he was in care for the entirety of his childhood and felt really loved and supported by his great uncle. But he still wonders sometimes, you know, would he, would he and his siblings been placed in foster care if their parents had had access to good jobs, you know, good city jobs, if they had ha had access to drug rehab programs, you know, this is, we're talking about like the, the war on drugs and how um, that war really decimated black communities. So, you know, it's really important to think about like, what, how could the, our society as a whole had better supported, you know, people's like DeMonte's parents and all the other parents who end up in the system. Um, and the fact is, if we had a stronger social safety net, if our society was less unequal, fewer families of color would ever wind up in the system in the first place. So that, that's why true prevention starts long before families ever come to the attention of the child welfare system. This kind of prevention, which is sometimes called primary prevention, involves exp expanding access to programs and services that reduce some of the risk factors that are related to child welfare involvement, such as substance abuse, poverty, of course, um, and domestic violence. So while primary prevention mostly occurs outside the child welfare system, child welfare agencies can funnel their resources towards helping ensure children and families have their basic needs met. I feel like Jessica Chandler, during our previous panel, she made a really strong, a really strong argument for, you know, really helping families have their basic needs met, you know, around housing, healthcare, job training, employment, and all those really important things. Um, and so this first recommendation encourages child welfare agencies to take these proactive steps. And on this slide, we have the three different types of pre prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And so primary prevention, of course, it strengthens all families and communities th through strategies that reduce poverty and drug use, increase health access, and improve school readiness. Um, secondary, secondary prevention, which is part of what the child welfare system does. These strategies are targeted to children and families at risk of becoming involved in the child welfare system. And these strategies include family resource centers, parent education, and home visiting. Um, and this child welfare system mostly engages in tertiary prevention. These strategies address the trauma experienced by children and families by providing reunification services, permanency planning, and other services and supports. So later this year, the Family First Prevention Services Act is gonna go into effect. Under Family First, the federal government is for the first time providing funding to state child welfare agencies for prevention. So family, while Family First is a, it's a step in the right direction, it has some real limitations. You know, for example, under this bill, federal funds are only available when a child is considered a candidate for foster care. This means that state child welfare agencies can't draw down funding for many programs and services that would help prevent neglect and abuse from happening in the first place. Another limitation of Family First is that there are only 27 prevention programs that are eligible for, for federal funding. Out of these 27, only one of them is for adults struggling with substance abuse. None of these programs are about ensuring access to job training, education, and other resources that would help keep families out of, out of crisis, you know, that would help prevent maltreatment in the first place. So Family First is a good start, but it really shouldn't limit our approach to prevention. The second recommendation has to do with how our system responds to families in crisis. So imagine a situation where, uh, you know, a teenage boy has been placed with relatives who he doesn't know all that well. He's, you know, he's been dealing with a lot of trauma and he's trying his best to process it and to heal from it. But one day his emotions get the best of him and he gets into a heated argument with one of his relatives. This relative, his aunt, let's say, she is not sure how to, how to calm him down in this heated moment. She's, she's afraid that he might hurt her or himself. And so she calls the police. When law enforcement intervene in a situation like this, the, the situation is likely to escalate. And even if the police don't arrest the teenager, the whole experience can be re-traumatizing. Situations like this are why this year, the California is rolling out the Family Urgent Response System, or FERS. FERS is a hotline available exclusively to current and former foster youth and their caregivers who want support from a behavioral health specialist in moments of crisis or uncertainty. Hopefully something like FERS will be one day available to all families, not just current and former foster youth and their families, and their caregivers rather. Um, and hopefully something like FERS will be available, especially to families living in communities that are over-policed and over-incarcerated. In 2004, the state of New Jersey started implementing an urgent response system for children experiencing emotional or behavioral crises. Since then, 
94% of children who have been served by that FERS-like system have been able to remain in their homes. So the third recommendation is to limit removals on the basis of neglect. And this is a topic that was covered on the panel with um, Phyllis, Jessica, um, Thomas, and others. Um, so you can see the statu statutory definition of neglect on this slide. Currently, more than 60% of the children in the foster care system are separated from their parents based on this definition of neglect. And what we all know is that we live in a society that tends to not only look down on people looking at living, look down on people living in poverty, but also blames them for their circumstances, especially if they're black or brown. And of course, this bias has seeped into how the child welfare responds to low-income families. Not being able to clothe, feed, or house a child is different from neglecting that child. Children should, shouldn't be separated from their parents simply because a family is living in poverty. So instead of allowing a family's circumstances to dictate whether a child stays with their parents, the law could be re rewritten to put the onus on the court to show that parents refuse services and supports that were actually readily accessible to them. Recommendation number four is to fund legal representation for parents before a removal petition is filed. So the so funding is really you know a, a key word here because we we would want for parents to have really qual high quality legal representation, um, and so states can draw down federal 4E funding to provide legal representation for parents and children when the child becomes a candidate for a candidate for foster care. What this means is that anytime a child or parent is receiving prevention services, they can also be provided representation. And just based on research, the most effective pre-partition legal representation programs use an, interdiscipl an interdisciplinary approach that includes attorneys, social workers, and peer advocates. These practitioners help keep parents and children together by providing supports and services for housing, domestic violence, child care, and other issues that sometimes lead to maltreatment and sometimes lead to removals. Between 2009 and 2016, the Detroit Center for Family, for Family Advocacy implemented a pre-partition legal program. Most of the program's cases were referred by the local child protection agency. During the first three years of that program, none of the children served by the center entered foster care. So this next recommendation calls for implementing a blind removal process. In a blind removal process, an investigating social worker writes a report, and that report is sent to a committee of child welfare professionals who make a, recommend, um, who make a recommendation about whether that child should be placed in out-of-home care. But before that committee receives the report, it's all identifying information is, remo is removed from the report, including race, ethnicity, names, and address and zip code. Um, and so the goal of, of blind removal is to reduce the effects of racial bias in the child welfare process. Just to give you a sense of what, you know, what the impacts of this bias are, in California, black children are nearly three times as likely to be subject to an allegation of abuse and neglect. They're more, than four, they're more than three times as likely to have that allegation substantiated, and they're more than four times more likely than their white peers to enter into foster care. When Nassau County, New York began implementing blind removal in 2011, or I think it was 2010, 55% of children entering foster care in the county were black. Four years later, that number was down to 29%. The next category of policy recommendations focuses on children and families who are in the foster care system. So when, it's in, when the court decides it's necessary and appropriate to separate a child from their parents, child welfare agencies should make every effort to engage the child's own family in the placement decision and to help children stay connected to their family, their community, and their culture. California has put a greater emphasis in recent years on relative placements by providing basic foster care funding to relatives and extended family members. But the system wasn't really designed with the child's family in mind. And so a lot of the requirements for becoming a relative caregiver result in relatives being screened out. We really have to look at the underlying structures of foster care to dismantle all the barriers that prevent children from, from remaining connected to their family and their community. This recommendation, recommendation number six, it refers to voluntary placement agreements or VPAs. Instead of filing a removal petition, child welfare agencies can use VPAs to place a child with a relative for a set amount of time while providing foster care funding to children and relatives, as well as reunification services to a child and their parents. In implementing VPAs, 
child welfare agencies could give parents the opportunity to say where they'd like a child to be placed. During the same conversation, the parents, extended family, and child welfare agency could agree to work towards reunification without a formal case being filed in dependency court. Our panelists today, they spoke at, at length about the lack of trust between the child welfare system and the communities and families it serves. As both Judge Abby and Erica Glenn noted, families know when they need help, but our system doesn't really give parents the opportunity to proactively ask for help. Ideally, parents will be able to voluntarily, voluntarily elect to receive services and supports and choose a placement for their child while still retaining their due process protections, such as the rights to a lawyer and court oversight of the out-of-home placement, placement so it doesn't continue indefinitely. A VPA could offer all of that and be a proactive way to engage parents who need and want support. The next recommendation also relates to VPAs. So VPAs, they exist in California and federal law, but they're not actually used that often in practice. Um, instead of VPAs, child welfare agencies often use safety plans and other agreements that separate the child from the parent without any due process protections. If a child is removed from their home under a safety plan, there's little oversight to ensure the removal was appropriate and the child and caregiver don't receive funding or supports and services. And because safety plans aren't time limited, children can remain in a relative's home indefinitely without the parent and child be being given the opportunity to reunify. There should be a legal mechanism for, fam for families to challenge safety plans in court because safety plans aren't actually legally sanctioned. And when a child welfare agency decides to remove a child from their home, they should have to prove the removal was appropriate and provide necessary, necessary funding, services, and supports to the children and the family. The next recommendation addresses the issue known as hidden foster care. Hidden foster care occurs when the child welfare agency encourages the relative caregiver to pursue a legal guardianship, guardianship in the probate court instead of ordering that the child be placed in foster care through the, through the dependency court. If the child welfare system really wants to help families heal, find a permanent home for the child, and give parents and children a chance at reunification, hidden foster care is anti antithetical to those goals. To start with, this practice of hidden foster care robs parents of the legal protections they're guaranteed when the county agency files a removal petition. And when a probate guardianship occurs, the entire family loses out on the funding, supports, and services offered in the dependency system, including reunification services. If a parent supports a legal guardianship, there's no reason to refer the relative to probate court because California statute allows the juvenile court to order guardianships. That said, 360 guardianships, as they're called, they're rarely, rarely utilized because they require that parents admit to, admit to abuse and neglect. To address this specific issue, the dependency court could, could allow for the parent and potential guardian to file for guardianship before the removal petition is filed. This way, the court wouldn't have to make a formal finding of abuse and neglect against the parent. The law could also be amended to give parents the ability to choose a guardian, assuming the agency doesn't identify a clear and present health and safety risk to the child. The next, the next recommendation focuses on the structure of child and family te team meetings, which, we, which the panelists spoke, spoke about extensively during the first panel of the morning. So CFT meetings were designed to really center family voice in the case planning process. State policy requires that CFT meetings be held at least every six months, but family, but family members can request a meeting whenever they feel it's necessary. So these, the structure of the meetings is family-centered in theory, but it plays out really differently in, pra in practice. That's, part of, that's a big part of what Erica, Erica Glenn was speaking about um, in terms of how uncomfortable and off-putting the CFT meeting experience was for her. For one thing, Erica wasn't told that she could have a peer facilitator with her, and because the meeting was held in an office environment, she was really preoccupied with how she was presenting herself to the representatives of the county agency, who were the same people who were ultimately going to decide the fate of her case. Erica wishes that they could have done her CFT meeting on the go, walking around her neighborhood in a way that really allowed her to tell her, tell her story, you know, kind of like spoken word. That would have given the social workers the chance to really see how she moves and operates in the environment where she feels most like herself. Like the other recommendations in this category, uh, recommendation number 10 has to do with relative placements. California has made real strides in recent years to place more children with relatives and extended family. 
as part of the continuum of care reform, the state made basic foster care funding available to relative caregivers, so long as they were able to pass a vetting process called resource family approval, or RFA. One consequence of RFA, perhaps unintended, is that relatives often have to meet similar licensing standards as, as non-relative foster parents. So if we know that relatives, if we know that children who are placed with relatives have fewer placement changes and are more likely to, to be reunified with their parents, why wouldn't the state create a process that makes it easier for relatives who want to step up as caregivers? One barrier to relative placements in the RFA process is the criminal history, history review, which Sonique Levias talked about during the first panel of the day. So Sonika and her husband had to wait for more than three months to get their grandson placed place with them because her husband had been arrested many times in his youth. He was never convicted of anything, but the county wanted to make sure his arrest record from 20 years ago didn't reflect his fitness as a caregiver. As the movement for Black Lives has made so painfully clear, law enforcement targets and harasses young Black men and women as well. This is one reason why there are such deep racial disparities in the criminal justice system. So taking all this into consideration, California could join the 40 other states that offer waivers for non-safety issues when placing a child in a relative's home. Another barrier to relative placements is the space requirements. So let's say you have three siblings who are being removed from their home. Their grandmother wants to step, as a, step up as a caregiver even though she lives in a small one bedroom apartment. If the county decides that there isn't enough space in grandma's apartment, those siblings may be separated. There, of course, need to be some requirements, but social, social workers should have a lot more discretion. The fact is, black and brown families dealing with poverty, poverty that's often a direct result of structural racism, have been, these families have been raising kids in difficult living situations for generations. The system should trust their ability and judgment and give them the funding and support to make it work. The final category of recommendations focuses on how children and families exit the child welfare system. Families in the system have often experienced multiple forms of trauma. There's a trauma that led to the child being separated from their parent and a trauma of the separation itself. Addressing and healing this trauma should be a top priority as child welfare agencies work to help families find permanent homes for children, whether with parents, relatives, or another loving caregiver. But existing policies and practices around reunification don't really give families enough time and space to heal and come to an informed decision about their preferred permanency arrangement. One way to give families more agency in the, in the reunification process is to allow the court to extend family reunification timelines beyond the limits that are currently imposed by federal and state law. So under current law, parents have to complete court-ordered reunification services within 12 to 24 months of the child being placed in out-of-home care. If the child is under the age of three, parents have to complete reunification services within six to 12 months. The question is, do these timelines reflect whether a child feels safe and supported in their caregiver's home, or whether a child has had ample time and opportunity to heal their relationship with their child? The social issues that feed into the child welfare system, such as poverty, addiction, mental illness, and family and community violence, these issues can be traced back to generations of systemic oppression. And I think that's what Judge Abby and other people on the panel, you know, including Jessica Chandler, were talking about. So it's unreasonable to expect family members to fully reckon with their own challenges within a certain time frame when these larger forms of, of oppression remain essentially unchanged. As, she, as Seneca shared during, her first, during the first panel, her grandson's mother was in foster care herself. If the system failed the mother once and will fail her again, if it doesn't give her the time and resources to, to continue getting sober and find permanent housing for her family. If Sonika is willing to take care of her grandson for the time being, why should she have to choose between guardianship or adoption right now? This next recommendation has to do with visitation, which is a critical component of the reunification process. So as Erica Glenn shared, during the first panel of the day. Reification, it really wasn't helpful for her in terms of like really being able to spend quality time with her, her child and, all, and, and also just really have an opportunity to, to reconnect with, with him. Um, so the one issue with the standard visitation order is that it almost always begins with supervised visitation for just a few hours a week. And visits are often scheduled during working hours and at locations that are far from parents live, far from where parents live. You know, as Erica Glenn shared, she had to travel an hour and a half each way to meet her son at a McDonald's where she had to, where she could barely afford to buy him a treat because of the financial stress that many parents in the child welfare system face. 
Ideally, visitation would be structured around parents' work schedules and transportation needs, as well as the other parts of their case plans. So um, the next recommendation has to do with um, reunification services. Like visitation, court-mandated services are a part of the reunification process that can be burdensome to parents rather than productive and helpful. The stress of being separated from one's, one's child cannot be understated. Piled on top of that stress is a case plan full of requirements such as parenting classes, counseling, drug tests, and therapy. So even if these services would be beneficial to the child and the parent, it can be really challenging for the parent to complete them if they're not re readily accessible in their community and provided free of cost by the county. Instead of the onus being placed on parents to locate and pay for services, the county should be required to fund services and ensure they're truly accessible to parents. The next recommendation focuses on how, on how families negotiate with the child welfare system to find a permanent home for their child. There's no one size fits all approach to permanency and the law does try to account for that. In California, a relative who doesn't want to adopt can choose guardianship and a relative who doesn't want to become a legal guardian can choose to be a fit and willing relative. There's no value judgment attached to any of these permanency options, but in practice, the system views adoption as the most preferable option followed by legal guardianship. One of our panelists spoke about how she and her husband were asked if they would be willing to pursue adoption or legal guardianship even before their grants that had been placed in their home. Instead of pressuring families in this way, the system should provide them with all the information they need to make a decision that feels right for them. The next recommendation focuses on, focuses on adoption and termination of parental rights. Under California law, before a child can be adopted out, out of foster care, the court must take the step of terminating parental rights. This is the step that Phyllis described as really chilling, you know, just that realization that the parent has no, will no longer have the, a legal option to, to regain custody of their child. Um, historically, TPR or termination of parental rights was used to break apart Native American families and further erode the social foundation of Native communities. That's why in 2010, California became the first state in the country to implement what's called tribal customary adoption. Under this new law, Indian children who are protected by the Indian Child Welfare Act can be adopted without CPR. Tribal customary adoption transfers legal parental rights to the adoptive parent, but it doesn't sever those rights. Given the past and present harms perpetuated by the child welfare system against Black and Latino families, California could consider incorporating adoption without TPR in the non-tribal court system. The second to last recommendation, I know there have been a lot of them, it also has to do with uh, termination of parental rights. Under California law, the court must terminate parental rights after a certain time period if the child is deemed quote unquote adoptable. The problem is the court can decide a child is adoptable even if they're not living with a caregiver who's interested in adopting them. This, in practice, the mean, this means that legally adoptable children age out of the foster care system without having found a stable and loving home. A disproportionate number of these children are black. In order to prevent parents from losing their, their parental rights in this way, the law should be amended so that the court must consider other factors beyond adoptability. The final recommendation has to do with how the system measures success. There continues to be a focus on the size of the total foster care population, the number of children entering and exiting the system, and the length of stay in foster care. States have to track this, these data and meet certain targets in order to remain eligible for federal funding and avoid federal penalties. While these data are important, they don't tell a full story of healing, re reconnection, and thriving. If we're being honest, we know that the racial disproportionality and disparities in the child welfare system won't be solved simply by reducing the number of Black, Native, and Latino children who enter the system or by reducing the amount of time they spend in the system. Think about Demonte Thompson, the, um, the moderator of the first panel this morning. He was in foster care for the entirety of his childhood, and he felt loved and supported by his great uncle. Um, excuse me. And he was also, and he and his siblings were also able to take advantage of Chafee funding to go to college. How could data accurately capture the quality of his connections with his family members, or his educational progress, or his understanding of his racial identity? As child welfare pr practitioners and advocates, these are the sorts of questions we have to start asking in order to build an equitable and just system. So just give me one moment.
Okay. Um, sorry. Just have to shuffle my notes around. Um, we'll soon be joined by Dr. Jessica Price of the Florida Institute for Child Welfare. Um, so I want you to think about the comprehensive blueprint for reform that I've you know, introduced with these 17 policy recommendations. And again, we'll be able to discuss these uh, policy recommendations later in the day during the breakout sessions. Um, Dr. Price, she's going to talk about how reforms like the ones I've talked about would fit into a bigger picture of revolutionary change in child welfare. So during these breakout discussions, participants will examine and critique the policy recommendations that I talked about during my presentation. And so I just want to reiterate that these recommendations are part of a, they're, they're a work in progress and really we want to um, just gather your feedback. And we also, we've also created a survey to um, allow, allow people to share their feedback about the recommendations at their leisure. Um, we're going to put the link to that survey in the chat right now. And so if you want to participate in the breakout discussions, please re return to the Zoom room a little before 2 p.m. so that we can open the breakout rooms on time. Um, and that's about it for now. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll, of course, stick around. Um, but otherwise, we'll see you a little before 2 p.m. Thank you. Full and lively a discussion as we did in breakout room number three. Um, to everyone who joined us today, thank you for listening, learning, and participating. Thank you again to all of our panelists, speakers, moderators, facilitators, co-sponsors, and funders. You are all an integral part of this event. Um, as I said at the beginning of the day, this summit would not have been possible without all the people who have worked for generations to create an, to create an equitable and just child welfare system for Black, Native, and Latino families and communities. Um, this summit is really a first step towards building a stakeholder coalition, including those directly impacted by the system, advocates, activists, and practitioners to turn these policy recommendations into reality in the state of California and, and beyond. Um, and so we are going to revise the report and policy recommendations based on your feedback in the breakout groups, as well as the survey that I shared before we broke for lunch. Um, and we'll follow up next month with a revised report and with information about how you all can actively participate in the coalition. Um, and one last thing that I'd like to add is that, you know, last year during the, the protest that followed the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others, I think a lot of people thought back to the 60s and the last time that we had, you know, protests of that scale fighting for racial justice. Um, and so one way to look at it is that we maybe haven't moved as far as we would like to think that we've moved. Um, and even if that's true, I think really what that 50 year time gap says to me is that, you know, it speaks to the urgency of this moment. Um, and so with that idea in mind, the urgency uh, towards action, I'd wanna share a quote from Shirley Chis Chisholm, who was the first black woman elected to the US Congress. And that quote is, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. And I feel like we've spoken about a lot of really worthwhile ideas over the course of the last four or five hours. So I hope that moving forward, we'll really implement those ideas. Um, so until our next conversation, take care, please be well, be, safety, be safe and healthy, especially as we continue to get out of this pandemic. And we will talk to you very soon. Take care and thank you.